At the end, during the trial, you admitted what the judge later called some of the worst child I had, ever seen. I had no choice but to plead guilty. Think about me one more time before you go. I remember punches, I remember having I've been feeling this way for far too long And now you're gone you Took me away from my God. If there was no food in, he'd go to the shop, he'd nick it and he'd come back and he'd, you know, he'd feed us and he'd make sure we would, like, clean. The head call the police. Um, my son hasn't come back from school yet. Pardon? I said I'm with my son missing. He hasn't been back from school. Right. Well, I haven't seen him since this morning. OK, what's your name, please? Mrs Ruth, I'm the... I think that we were let down by the police at the time, we were let down by social services, we were let down by everyone that was in our lives that were meant to care. You know, I never said I wouldn't be biased. I don't think I've ever claimed to make objective content. You might even call me subjective, but I don't just feel. I know what evil looks like. I'm tired of being neutral. And I'm not going to just tell the story. And you may think that's not how true crime is supposed to be done, but if you check the comments, you'll find a whole horde of other people that appreciate me shedding the sugar coat. If that's not your style, fair enough. I bid you a kind farewell. But I don't want to speak for evil. I want to speak for innocence. And tell its story by unearthing the truth buried beneath the surface of the lies. Real victims should be heard, especially when it comes to kids like Ricky Neve and his siblings. I mean, I've definitely covered some truly evil mothers and fathers on this channel. From the Kamari Holland story to the Isaiah Torres tragedy, I feel like I've seen some of the worst parents the darkness has to offer. But if there was ever an award for Britain's worst mother, I'd say Ruth Neve would be a pretty good contender. What you're about to hear contains themes that aren't pleasant. The details are outrageous, and the path of this twisted story is lined with thick black thorns waiting to snag the hearts of those who seek the truth about what happened to a six-year-old boy named Ricky Neve. His story must be told, and those who wronged this innocent little child must never forget what they did. I'm Mr. Black, and this is The Disturbing Truth about a little boy who walked with monsters. The city of Peterborough in eastern England has a population of over 200,000 residents. It's a place known for its medieval heritage and a large cathedral that dates back 1,300 years. Home to two famous ancient settlements, there's no doubt that Peterborough is rooted in deep British history. However, in recent times, the city has seen itself stumble socially, having won the title of worst place to live in England not once, not twice, but three times, the last of which was in 2021. An unnamed and unhappy resident stated, the atmosphere in Peterborough is draining. You feel totally isolated from the rest of the world and life in general, as though everything is going on and you're not a part of it as you're stuck in this dump. That said, there are still those who would counter this claim, saying not only is the city a nice place to live in, but it's also quite affordable. Either way you sway in your opinion of Peterborough, it'll always be the home of the horrible crime that we're discussing today. Ruth Ann Gregg was born on August 18th of 1968 in London, England. She grew up battling anorexia, and her father, Alex Gregg, an ex-Navy merchant was confined to a wheelchair 
and wanted little to do with his children. He fell ill while in Japan and chose to seek medical attention. But after being injected with an unknown substance, he ended up paralyzed for the rest of his life. Alongside Ruth, the Greggs gave birth to a son named Mark. Mark Gregg was born blind. Even he stated that his father was an understandably bitter man. Then when Mark was one year old, he was placed in care and rarely had contact with his family again. From the age of two, Ruth was also left to the mercy of social services as she floated from foster home to foster home before finally finding herself back in the care of her parents. But when Ruth returned to the Greggs, she showed signs that she'd been physically abused in the system. She was quickly labeled a disturbed child or at very least en route to becoming one. Her own mother told authorities that she feared her daughter was unable to feel empathy or affection, something Mrs. Gregg was said to have struggled with herself. Entering her adolescent years, Ruth hardly ever saw her parents. Later on, both Mr. and Mrs. Gregg died in a suicide pact. Ruth spent the rest of her upbringing in the care of Cambridgeshire Social Services. As a teen, Ruth would reportedly skip school to drink on the streets with anyone she could call a friend. She was often reported missing from her care home and was known to run away at the drop of a dime. After multiple run-ins with law enforcement, Ruth was assessed by professionals and deemed to be something called an inadequate psychopath. I don't know what that means now, but back then, in the 70s, it meant someone was unable to feel empathy. This type of person would be prone to difficult relationships. Ultimately considered much less of a threat than some other personality disorders, an inadequate psychopathic person is more likely to cause problems for themselves later in life if they don't get treatment early on. And it can be brought on by what you might call sustained cruelty during childhood. Ruth ended up in a place called Salters, an all-female, secure unit in Peterborough for kids that have disorders like Ruth has. This is a secure unit where children and young people are held under lock and key. There are 45 of these units in England. Every year, some 1,500 boys and girls between the ages of 11 and 18 pass through them. They are known as the last resort of our childcare system. Local authorities pay over a thousand pounds a week to keep a child here. Salters in Cambridgeshire is a small secure unit attached to an observation and assessment center. It houses six girls. They may spend just a couple of days here, or well, they may be here for six months or more. The courts send girls to secure units for many reasons. On the run from care, involved in drugs or prostitution, at risk of abuse, or suicidal. For those convicted of offences, it's an alternative to prison. So all sorts of young people find themselves locked up together. But it didn't help. Seems like Ruth just got worse. She was a violent resident, making all sorts of threats towards staff and the other residents of Salters. There was even an incident where staff had to restrain Ruth and pry a pair of scissors out of her fingers. It was also around this time that Ruth is thought to have started self-harming. When she was 16, she left Salters and met a 23-year-old man named Trevor Harvey. In March of that year, the pair settled down in Cambridge. Then in 1986, they welcomed their first child as a couple and named her Rebecca. Two years later, their son Ricky was born. However, Ruth and Trevor's relationship came to a halt a few years later in 1991. He stated that when he and Ruth were together, she was all right, but not exactly what you classify as normal. She hadn't split up with Trevor Harvey for more than a year when she married Dean Neve. Ruth and Dean met at court. She'd been summoned for riding her bike without lights, and Dean was facing serious drug charges, plus a couple of other petty crimes. Their meeting resulted in a one-night stand that brought Rochelle Neve into this world. Later on, Ruth, Dean, and the whole family moved to the Welland Housing Estate in Peterborough in 1992. While Dean was serving time in prison, Ruth had Ricky's name changed to Neve in order to match it up with her new husband. A year or two later, Ruth gave birth to her third daughter, Sheridan Neve. 
The Neve family lived on Red Mile Walk, a part of the Welland estate renowned for rough drug use, crime, and antisocial behavior. These issues plagued the residents of Red Mile. The Neve family was no exception. Dean was known around the area for dealing. Ruth was known for depending. They say she often sent her children out to buy her amphetamines, telling them that it was sherbet. And she spent a good 40 bucks a week on sherbet, which was a big chunk of the money they had. This meant her kids went without, while she stayed good and fixed up. Neighbors often reported the Neves to social services, and later even testified against Ruth in court, claiming the children in the Neve house were frequently spotted wandering around the estate at all hours often without food or adequate clothing. During these times, it's believed that Ruth stayed home and found a way to get her money into her bloodstream. Dean Neve was hardly ever home. Ruth blamed Ricky for this, claiming that Dean hated his stepson. During one of his prison stints, Ruth is said to have written horrible things to Dean about Ricky, saying she'd burnt him with a match, punched his little face, and that she just wants to kill the little boy, but she can't bring herself to do it. Ruth said she hated Ricky sometimes simply because he laughed at her. She even asked Dean what she should do, kill Ricky or kill herself. As cheeky and bubbly as he could be, Ricky was described by one of his neighbors as a sad little messenger of misery roaming the streets of Welland Estate. But other residents weren't fully aware of just how deep desperation had dug into the Neve house because behind closed doors, Ruth tortured her children. She admitted it. She confessed to a catalog of abusive actions she performed on Ricky and his poor sisters. She burned them with cigarettes. She forced the kids to stand for extended periods of time while repeatedly tapping them on the head. She even put the word idiot on one of their foreheads and refused to let them scrub it off. One time she grabbed Ricky by the hair, jerked his head back, and squirted liquid soap down his throat. I was told that as the six-year-old struggled to breathe, he cried out, Mommy, I love you. The disturbing truth will continue in a moment. Ruth should never be allowed to use the title Mommy, or Mother, Mom, Human, Animal. She's an insult to all those words. Once a victim, now a monster with nothing but darkness coursing through her veins and hate in her cold, rotten heart. She had it in for her daughters, too. She'd often pick them up and strangle them until they were unconscious. She beat one of them so hard with a hairbrush that she broke it over them. And after one of the little girls was caught playing with matches, Ruth burned her hand until it was blistering. I had no choice but to plead guilty. She often locked her naked children in rooms that had become soaked in urine. The kids tried desperately to get the attention of their neighbors, but their cries either weren't heard or they fell upon deaf ears. Ruth was also once spotted dangling Ricky over a bridge by his angles just above a river, and a witness even took action, notifying social services. But nothing happened to Ruth. I'm not even sure if they looked into the complaint. Ricky was finally put on the at-risk register in April of 1994 after Ruth repeatedly told social workers that she was going to kill Ricky if they didn't do something. So they did. They took Ricky into short-term care repeatedly just to give Ruth time to get the help she needed. But resources in the system were stretched and social services were keen on keeping families together if at all possible. But I don't know if they were aware of the torture the Neve children faced daily while living with Ruth. Later, it would come out that due to constant staff changes and under-resourcing, a file critical to Ricky's case was carelessly lost. This is yet another case where children were failed by everyone at every angle and neglected by those who were supposed to protect them. A woman named Debbie Lawson was assigned to the Neve family. She complained that her workload was just too much and later mentioned something about problems with the East team affecting management of the case. Another social worker said Ruth was physically violent, recalling one occasion where Neve plowed her fist into a wall right next to the social worker's face. It seems Ruth's violence wasn't limited to children. Nevertheless, 
Despite the overwhelming evidence of abuse in the form of bruises, cuts, burns, and other things, Ruth explained it all away by blaming it on accidents and even clumsiness on Ricky's part. It was an obvious lie, but Ruth's excuses were accepted. She always had an explanation. Could be falling down a flight of steps or walking into a table. For every injury that showed up on the Neve children, Ruth could explain it away with ease. To make matters worse, they'd known what kind of person Ruth was for 20 years. Right back to the trouble she got into when she was a teenager. She was no stranger to the professionals. One of them has even admitted that they took Ruth's word too easily when it came to her lying excuses. And so, her reign of terror continued. At some point, Rebecca Neve was taken into care. Despite this, Ricky remained with Ruth. To try and help, Ricky's paternal grandfather would pick Ricky up from time to time and let him stay with him and his wife. He wasn't a fan of Ruth, and he did his best to avoid contact with her. But no matter how long Ricky stayed with his grandfather, as soon as he set foot back on Red Mile Walk in the Welland Estate, Ruth's cycle of abuse would pick back up where it left off and the circle would continue unbroken. On the morning of November 28, 1994, Ricky Neve left his house on foot to follow his normal route to school. School was less than a third of a mile away from where he lived. Ruth said Ricky never even told her he loved her that day. He just left. Yeah, well, Ruth, the poor little guy probably thought he knew what was best for him. Six-year-old Ricky Neve was last seen talking to some workmen on the estate. The men could tell something was bothering the child, so they asked him what was wrong. Ricky didn't answer. He just started crying and ran away. It should have only taken the little boy about eight minutes to get to school, but he was known to skip class quite often. He had a big history of truancy, so the school never even alerted Ruth that Ricky hadn't shown up that day. I read somewhere that he hadn't shown up the previous day either. And still, no call from the school. Add that to the list of failures in this story. But when the dark of the evening rolled in, and Ricky still hadn't returned home, Ruth finally notified the cops. I had quite a police. Um, I don't know if I've come back from school yet. Pardon? I said I've got a report with my son missing. He hasn't been back from school. Then while friends and family were out at night searching for the little boy, Ruth chose to stay home. Yeah. She's a real sweetheart, isn't she? The following day, on November 29th of 1994, they found Ricky Neve less than a mile away from his house. Unfortunately, he was dead. His body was recovered from a wooded area off I Road near Willoughby Court, an estate Ricky was known to visit often to play with his friends. The six-year-old was found lying flat on his back. He had been stripped of his clothing and purposely posed in a star shape on the ground. Investigators likened the position to Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man drawing. The boy had also been strangled. Then roughly a foot away from Ricky's left hand, perched perfectly on a leaf, was a single, small, white shirt button. There was no sign of Ricky's clothes at the scene. They were later found in a nearby trash can. Ricky's shoes were still tied in a bow. His little white shirt was recovered with three buttons missing, two of which were never found. If you ask me, they were souvenirs taken by the killer. At 12.03 p.m., Ruth Neve was consoled by police who informed her that her six-year-old son was dead. A murder investigation was promptly launched. Ricky's granddad, Morris Harvey, had been actively searching for Ricky since the moment he heard his grandson was missing. He was at home in the kitchen when he spotted two officers walking up the path to his door. The look on their faces spelled bad news loud and clear. After hearing the news, the grief-stricken granddad was too in shock to identify Ricky's body. Instead, the boy's father, Trevor Harvey, went to Hinchingbrook Hospital to confirm the identity of his son. A post-mortem was conducted at the same facility by Dr. Nat Carey. Carey determined that the poor boy's cause of death was due to ligature strangulation. 
the weapon used on Ricky Neve to steal his life force was said to be the child's own jacket. Marks were observed on Ricky's neck as well as smaller marks that appeared to correlate with the zippers on the jacket. The jacket had been wrapped around the child's neck and pulled tight from behind for an extended period of time. The doctor later explained that due to the amount of pressure the jacket was being pulled at, it's likely Ricky passed away in roughly 30 seconds. It was certainly no accident. But that isn't everything. Investigators working the case concluded that the assault on Ricky probably took him by surprise. He had no defensive wounds on his body. There was zero evidence that the child attempted to fight off his attacker, and it seemed like Ricky went willingly into the wooded area. Either he felt safe enough to do so on his own, or he went in there with someone he knew. Either way, the killer intended to murder the boy from the start. And at that point, they hadn't been caught. The Neve family was in hot water. Everyone was understandably suspicious. An aid worker named Bryony e. Smith had met with Ruth just two days before the murder. Miss Smith recounted how Ruth complained about her struggles with Ricky. She said the five-year-old's behavior was hard to handle and if she wasn't given help fast, she would end up killing her son. At the start, Dean Neve was looked at as a potential suspect, but he wasn't living with Ruth at the time of Ricky's murder. Turns out he suspected Ruth of sleeping around. Dean also said he was trying to steal a motorbike during the time of the crime. Police looked into his alibi and it checked out. So the obvious candidate for prime suspect was clearly Ricky's own spineless mother. Police began investigating Ruth Neve, where they quickly uncovered what you might call an unhealthy obsession with the occult. And no, I'm not aiming at you for reading tarot cards or casting love spells. In the 90s, Considering their aforementioned suspicions, what they found in Ruth's possession rang alarm bells. During a search of the Neve residence, authorities uncovered a black suitcase which contained occultist magazines, one of which had a print of Leonardo da Vinci's Bertravian Man. They also found a book called Magic in Theory and Practice by Alistair Crowley. Crowley is a controversial figure when it comes to British occultism. He's reported to be a sex-addicted drug fiend who used to perform ceremonial magic. He's been labeled as a traitor to all British people. For a while, Alistair called himself Great Beast 666. Later, he changed it to Messiah of Anti-Christianity, which is admittedly not very Jesus of him. Despite the insanity of what I just said, Alistair Crowley still pulled in a lot of followers, and Ruth Neve was one of them. A neighbor reported that Ruth was into black magic and that she claimed to be a high priestess in the occult. Neve initially denied these claims, but later she admitted that she does actually take interest in mysticism and the occult. She even talked about how she used tarot cards and Ouija boards, but, you know, those things have limits, and she was unable to use them to drag out any empathy or maternal love that she could direct towards her kids. Police also discovered a bunch of crime and murder magazines as well as books on famous serial killers like The Cray Twins, Ian Brady, or Myra Hindley. I'm not saying that reading or watching true crime means you fantasize about killing people. I'm just saying that Ruth Neve probably was. And I'd be willing to bet that, to someone like her, those materials were like playboys. Then they discovered a manuscript called The Perfect Murder. It was written by Ruth. And it wasn't the first time the document had been on the radar either. Apparently months before, Ruth had given the manuscript to a social worker named Deborah Lawson. It was wrapped up in a plastic bag. Ruth said, You might enjoy reading this, but it might keep you awake. It's a horror story. Miss Lawson had put it in the bag and then put the bag in the car and forgotten all about it until Ricky was murdered. The manuscript depicted a character called Richard, who had been brushed aside his whole life. In the story, after a rough night's sleep, Richard suddenly started killing women. At one point in the book, the character states, the most awful thing of all was that I never felt one ounce of guilt. The evil came out. I wish to God I could have controlled it. But these things weren't proof that Ruth killed anyone. Being into weird shit doesn't make you a child killer. And of course, Ruth protested her innocence. 
She even had her own theories about what happened to her son. She claimed she had a dream about a man who told her a woman was involved. Ruth told the police that a woman had taken Ricky in a buggy. They weren't convinced. Ruth continued to slam the police investigation in the press, stating, It's been three weeks since the murder, and they haven't even got a suspect. I could do a better job myself. Then she said, I'm going to be alone for Christmas. Throughout the investigation, the public feared the worst. It had only been a year since the tragic murder of two-year-old James Bulger. With the details of that terrible case still fresh in their minds, people began to wonder if there was a copycat killer. Parents even began escorting their children to school, and the police weren't shy about warning everyone to be vigilant. Detective Inspector George Collings stated that the investigation was ongoing. He was interested in tracking down the whereabouts of a group of boys between the age of 6 and 11 who had been seen with Ricky on Monday night, the day before he was killed. In light of these fears, however, Detective Inspector George Collings said, There is no one particular direction in which our inquiry is going at present, but it is fair to say that one element of the inquiry is the need to trace a group of young boys he was seen with the night before his death. These boys were said to be between the ages of 6 and 11. A second post-mortem was conducted in January of 1995, which simply confirmed all the findings of the previous one. Suspects were in and out of interviews, and the British press kept tabloids flowing with a constant stream of new details and theories about what happened to the little boy. But it was obvious who the public thought was responsible. On January 9th, 1995, Ruth Neve was arrested for the murder of her own five-year-old son, Ricky Neve. She was detained and brought in for questioning. Cambridgeshire police released a statement later that evening informing the public that the 26-year-old woman that they had arrested was in fact Ruth Neve. On January 21st of 1995, she was charged with cruelty and neglect under the Children's Act. On the 23rd of January, Ruth appeared at Peterborough Magistrate's Court for abuse committed on Ricky Neve and another one of her children who was not named for legal reasons. Ruth was also charged with assaulting a female detective named Heather Thompson on the day she was arrested. She was denied bail and remained in custody. Still mid-investigation, Ricky's funeral was held on the 14th of February in 1995 at King's Lynn Crematorium in Norfolk. There were only around 40 people in attendance. Rest in peace, six-year-old Ricky Neve. He deserved so much more than that. What a shame. Ruth's trial began the following year in October of 1996 at Northampton Crown Court. She admitted to the charges of neglect and cruelty. She confessed to the charges of supplying amphetamines and even burglary but she denied any involvement in her son's murder. The jury heard all about her past and her childhood struggles growing up. They were also presented with evidence documenting the systematic abuse Ricky and his siblings had been suffering from. Evidence considered during the trial included testimony from neighbors, friends, professionals, and even people Ruth met while out on bail. The prosecution put forward evidence that Ruth had attempted to falsely implicate countless people in her son's murder. It was also alleged that she was offering five bucks to anyone that would say they saw a specific man with Ricky, a man Ruth knew would have been close to the scene of the crime at the time. What a cold-hearted bitch. The month-long trial exposed the failings of social services, sparking a separate investigation at a later date. Suspected motives for the crime were put forward. They suggested Ruth Neve was obsessed with the occult and killed Ricky during a satanic ritual believing it would fix her relationship with her estranged husband, Dean Neve. Here's something worth noting. Police officer Robert McNeil testified that on the day Ricky was reported missing, he had searched the woods the boy was later found in. He was certain that Ricky had been killed somewhere else and moved into the woods. Officer McNeil's testimony was a stiff one, but apparently Ruth was with the police during the time when the moving of the body would have needed to have occurred. Because of this, the judge told the jury that if they believed Officer McNeil, they had to acquit Ruth Neve of murder because the timelines just didn't add up. 
Then after a 26-day trial, the jury reached a verdict that only took them six hours to agree upon. And when the verdict was read out, Ruth Neve bursted into tears. She had been unanimously found not guilty of the murder of six-year-old Ricky Neve. But she was found guilty of cruelty and neglect, though. And for that, she was sentenced to seven years in Holloway Prison. Seven years for the torturous neglect and heaps of abuse she inflicted on her children. The judge told her, You are plainly an inadequate person and wholly unfit to be a mother. I have to say I've rarely come across a case of such systematic cruelty to children. This is not a case of a sudden loss of temper, not a baby bashing case in the ordinary sense. The harm done to all these children is infinitely worse. It is incalculable. It will have a scarring effect on them. The court has to do its best to protect children. If we don't, no one else will. The sentence I pass has to reflect the public abhorrence. Ruth's two other children were taken away, and luckily, they've had little to no contact with her. But I hope the system didn't put them through even more shit. Ricky Neve's case was left unsolved, and with no new leads or suspects to go after, it lay dormant for decades. In October of 1997, a damning report came out detailing the failings of Cambridge Social Services when it came to the Neve children. It stated that Ricky could have easily been saved if he'd been taken away from Ruth when he should have. SSI inspectors also voiced concerns that the department was still failing a lot of at-risk children. Initially, three social workers that were involved in Ricky's care were suspended, but they were later reinstated. And the chief officials that should have been held accountable had all left by the time the report surfaced. Ted Unsworth, director-designate of Cambridgeshire Social Services, admitted that practice and management of the team involved in Ricky's care had fallen well below acceptable standards. He also said Ruth was good at covering up the abuse and countering suspicions. Unsworth stated, Social services staff were working to a care plan aimed at protecting the children and supporting the family as a whole, and normal decision-making processes were followed. I believe, with hindsight, we persisted for too long with a strategy in line with the principles in the Children Act 1989, which was designed to keep the family together. One of the things that has been clear throughout this case is how difficult it was to find out what was actually going on. There was a high level of concealment and convincing people that things were different from what they actually were. Much of the evidence given in court following the charges of cruelty and neglect was new to the department. He later said his staff did the best they could under the circumstances. Well, Ted, that's a real genuine backhanded apology. Your team was a complete failure. You couldn't have aided Ruth Neve in abusing her children more if you'd actually physically helped her abuse them. Best they could do? Oh yeah, okay, cool, if they're dead. Almost every decision the team made was the wrong one. They fueled the circumstances with their inaction. In my opinion, the team are in part responsible for Ricky Neve's murder and the prolonged abuse that the other Neve children were made suffer through. It was the team's job to do something. They knew bad shit was happening to kids and they did nothing. And that's a fact. Dean Neve ended up back in jail shortly after Ruth on the 8th of November for three years following convictions for bigamy and drug dealing. The prosecutor told the court how Dean had a bigamous marriage ceremony where he wed a woman named Marie Carter about a month before Ricky was murdered. He was obviously still Ruth's husband at the time, and in case you were unaware, that's what bigamy is. Dean's lawyer, Stephen Taylor, said that his client was off drugs and had made a new life for himself. He'd found a woman and was settling down in Northamptonshire with a child on the way. In October of 1999, Dean Neve died in a car accident at the age of 36 when his car ran off the road and plunged into a water-filled land dike. An unidentified female survived the accident. Ruth was released from prison in the year 2000. She remarried and spent years campaigning for her son's case to be reinvestigated, begging police to find her son's killer. Britain's once mother of evil 
was now playing the grieving mother in front of the cameras. Ruth would recount memories of Ricky calling him a popular inquisitive boy with a talent for pulling apart and repairing old electrical stuff like cassette recorders. Ruth stated, He was the most special little boy ever. A beautiful personality. Very loyal to people. My little best friend. He was the man of the house. He was his own little spirit. But I think I gave him too much freedom. No, Ruth. You just took too many liberties in the form of freedom that didn't belong to you. You destroyed what few basic rights children actually have. And they have less rights in general because people that care about them are supposed to protect them from making horrible decisions. But Ruth, you are, as a person, one big bad decision after the other. If I ordered a mother off the dark web, I suspect someone like you would arrive. Cold, manipulative, and hazardous to small children. Ricky Neves' murder remained unsolved for more than 20 years. Then in 2015, a breakthrough in scientific evidence brought some new details to the surface. Adhesive tape from Ricky's clothes was examined and DNA was collected. Then lo and behold, they struck a match. And guess who it was? Ruth is absolutely the wrong answer. Ricky Neve was six years old when he was murdered in Peterborough in November 1994. He was last seen leaving his school at around 9am on the morning of November the 28th. Ricky's body was found in a wooded area of High Road close to Willoughby Court at 12.05pm the following day, five minutes walk from his house in the Welling Estate. A post-mortem examination concluded that Ricky had died as a result of compression of the neck, strangulation. This is a category A unsolved child murder. And no unsolved serious crime is ever closed. Where there is an opportunity to bring those who escape justice to account, we will. Despite a lengthy investigation at the time, no one has ever been brought to justice in relation to Ricky's death. A detailed review of the original investigation has now been carried out by the recently formed and joint Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit. And as a result, we believe we have sufficient grounds to officially reopen the case. Tuesday when Ricky was found dead, like I said, the school rang me telling me he never went to school on the Monday. Then I found out 20 years later that he never went to school at all on the Monday either. Looking back, I can't stress enough how I coped. I was not eating myself, I was not on drugs, as people said I was. I was trying to sort my life out and get bad people out of my life. I don't care what my children say at the end of the day because they have been brainwashed. But I didn't beat them, I didn't starve them, I didn't burn them, torture any of them. Is this a large scale cover up? Yes, this is a large scale I think cover up. The main How process. high does it go with the Cambridge Well, I'll put it this way it goes to the point where they've been planting evidence on me that wasn't actually mine. So you're saying there is a large, wide scale, high level. Up yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's what we're fighting for. That if they don't know how to do the job properly or they can't be asked, the easiest option is to stitch somebody up, and that's what they do. That's a very, very, very yeah, to stitch serious somebody up. I don't up. care if it's a serious accusation or not. I got stitched up, and that is final. You're stitched up, and you're somebody that has never abused their children. Probably. No, not in the way that the public have heard about it, no. In which way did you abuse your children? 
So you're saying that you just never abused your key or anything. Not in the way that the whole media realised I have. Yeah, I have turned around. That he was on the at risk register. Yes, it was. At, yes, he no was. It was at the risk at register because yeah. he fell off the bunk bed yeah. and he had a black so eye. For, so for no good reason at all, he was on the at risk register. So I just turned and said to you, yeah. he got a black eye falling off the bunk bed. And while I was pregnant, the <coughs> optics would come round. I turned and said, oh, actually, they turned and said, They've understood because the bunk bed he fell from what the bottom bunk. And these, um, these things are quite crucial, aren't they? Because it, it suggests that the only person that Ricky was in danger from was you. No, he wasn't. No, no he wasn't. It's quite difficult to get up that bike and falling out of bed. Is that really? Well, he wasn't there. It must have been a shock when you got seven years in jail for it, then. <laughs> well, no comment. No comment. No comment. You don't even get seven years for murder. So what do you want to come from all of this? I want what to outcome? catch the person who murdered my son. What's the outcome that, that you're that's on? What I'm ex that's what I want. Having took drugs for 20 years. What, legal or prescribed? Prescribed, I do, but not illegal. What, it's very rude. It's, it's my business, thank okay. you. It's medical reasons. Prescribed by the doctor. Please stop taking drugs after Ricky's death. Uh, once after, and that was it, yeah. It's everything that's been written about you is rubbish, isn't it? Yes, it is. People were so easily led, didn't they? But now we're adding the teachers to the list of people. Yes. People, with social services and the police yes. and the media. Yes. And it's everybody's fault. Yes. But you bear no responsibility. I bear responsibility, yes I do. Well, but not for my like son's what murder. What, what responsibility do you bear? Because if you want people to take your story seriously, people want to know what responsibility you bear. Really? Yeah. What, 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 do you, what, what do you mean take responsibility for Well, what? you just said you bear responsibility. I'm yeah, I do. What do you bear? None of your business what I was about. Well, it is our business. No, it isn't. what happened to Ricky. <coughs> Boy. No, I'm not. Can you point out what you've done wrong? I know what I've done wrong, not being a great right mother. In what way? What do you mean in what way? So if I was being a not a good mother, I would probably be smacking my kids, not feeding my kids, not bothering to walk my kids to school at six years old, doing drugs. In what ways were you not a good mother? Taking drugs. I was not on drugs, as people said I was. Can you point out what you've done wrong? Taking drugs. In what ways were you not a good mother? Taking drugs. I was not on drugs, as people said I was. The real match was James Watson. <laughs> he was from the local area. Was Ruth actually innocent of murder? Who the hell was James Watson? At the time of Ricky's murder, James Watson was 13 years old. Believe it or not, in 1994, Watson had actually come forward as a witness following Ricky's murder. In a statement to police, James said he was skipping school to visit his father and Welland Estate on the day Ricky was killed. He also claimed he saw Ricky at about midday. James said he didn't really know Ricky, but he recognized him from the area. He claims that, in passing, Ricky commented, that's a big tractor, isn't it? Watson replied, That's not a tractor. It's a digger. And then walked away, never seeing the six-year-old again. But as an adult in 2016, James Watson reportedly changed his story the day before being told of the breakthrough in Ricky's case. DNA belonging to Watson was also identified on Ricky's trousers. While out on bail, 39-year-old James Watson snuck off to Portugal. The cold case of Ricky Neve reopened in 2014. Following extensive investigative work, the Crown Prosecution Service authorized charges to be brought on James Watson in connection with murder. Following the reveal, Ruth Neve made a statement. I am overwhelmed and in truth, totally numb. This has always been about getting justice for my son Ricky. I'd like to thank Paul Forward and his team for their work and effort in getting us to this moment. The news has not yet sunk in. 
The courtesy and care shown to me by Mr. Forward and his colleagues have exceeded by far the expectations I had. Today's news is welcome but it is only part of a much longer journey that still has some way to run. It would be inappropriate to comment further but what I am looking forward to is a good night's sleep that has been lacking over many many years. I would also like to place on record the love and support of my husband Gary. I cannot express fully how much I love him and the work he has put in to make the events of today possible. James Watson's trial began on January 4th of 2022. Prosecutor John Price told the jury that Watson expressed an unhealthy interest in the subject of child murder. This included things James said to his own mom that raised flags around the time of Ricky's murder. Even Watson's childhood teachers recalled that, straight after the murder, James had an odd fascination with what happened to Ricky Neve. He could rattle off every detail, and he did so often. Way more than an innocent 13-year-old should. The court also heard how James had been living in a care home at the time of the crime. The manager of the home testified that he once discovered the dismembered carcass of a pheasant in James Watson's room. And I'm not sure if it's the same bird or not, but James had been caught with a dead bird that had been left in the same pose Ricky's body was left in. Upon further investigation, James had been stashing magazines that focused mainly on babies and toddlers, many of them in underwear. The mother of one of Ricky's friends also testified that her son had been inappropriately touched by Watson when he was only five. The mom even reported the incident to the police and Watson was actually interviewed in the presence of a social worker, but James denied ever laying a finger on the boy. Watson was informed the matter wouldn't be taken further, but that it would remain on record. In 2015, the alleged victim, now an adult, was questioned again by police, but he couldn't recall the assault or the statements he made so long ago. Watson's surviving victim said that he and Ricky used to walk to school together and hang out on the estate frequently. The boy's mother went on to tell the court that on the night Ricky went missing, Watson's mother, Shirley Watson, now Shirley Cliff, claims James told her a child's body had been found strangled in the woodland. But Ricky's body wasn't found until the next day. Shirley Watson also testified on the stand during James's trial. She was accused of covering up for her son. James told police in his original statement from the 90s that he visited his mother Shirley at her home on the same day the murder was committed. Shirley had also given a statement in 1995 saying, I have been asked to explain a comment I made to my partner's daughter Melanie Giddings on November 27, 1994. Two days prior to this, I had a conversation by phone with my son James Watson. James told me that a baby had been found over the dike near Welland. He wanted me to say if what he had heard was true. I told him that I had not heard this before and knew nothing of what was said. As Prosecutor Price continued to grill Shirley Watson, she continued to refute her involvement. She went on to say that James hadn't been visiting her on the day Ricky Neve was murdered, and she stuck to that story. A school custodian that had come forward during the original investigation was also brought in via video conferencing to testify to her old statement in court. Her name was Sylvia Clary. Sylvia claimed she saw James and Ricky together on the day Ricky was killed. During the trial, the 90-year-old retired woman told the jury that she still clearly remembers the two boys outside her house on the Welland Estate between 8.30 and 8.45 in the morning. She was standing in her kitchen, looking out the window. Ricky had a school uniform on, and she recognized Watson because his father lived right behind her house. Sylvia claims James saw her through the window and even waved to her. She said James wasn't wearing his school uniform that day, and Miss Clary was 100% sure who she saw with Ricky Neve just before he disappeared. Prosecutor Price told the court that Watson was originally a suspect, but he had been ruled out due to a fundamental error in the original police investigation. That's devastating. This error has kept Ricky from getting justice all these years. James Watson denied knowing Ricky Neve, but Watson's brother testified that he and James had actually been to Ricky's home a couple of times when James was 11 or 12. Watson's half-brother Andrew Bailey also told the court that he himself had been to the Neve family home with James on several occasions to see Dean Neve. He claims they all used to go with Dean to look for old vehicles to strip down. And James Watson's ex-girlfriend, who can't be named or identified for legal reasons, also appeared in court. She testifies that she met James while in care when they were 14. 
She also alleges that James would lead her out into the woods and then choke her right in the middle of sex. She claims this excited him, but she told James she didn't like that and refused to speak to him for weeks after he put his hands around her neck. She went on to say that James has a positive side and a negative side. I personally wonder what other stories she could tell me about James Watson. If she doesn't have any, I bet someone out there does. You see, between Watson's lies and his masks, it's hard to find the fine lines. He claimed his father was a police officer, but there's no record of that. So when Watson's story changed from Ricky Who to, okay, I saw him, and I picked him up so he could see the dicker through the hole in the fence, you can see why people started feeling uneasy, especially when it came out with picture evidence that there was no fence in that location until much later. Ruth Neve also took the stand and attempted to play the doting mom trying to get justice for her son, but she was repeatedly shot down by the prosecution, who had no problem reminding her of the abuse her children suffered at her hands. She was charged and convicted of those crimes, but now Ruth claims she was bullied into the confession and that she was never abusive to her kids. But that's bullshit. Just ask her daughters, neighbors, social workers, or anyone else Ruth and her current husband want you to believe are conspiring against her. Ruth might have gotten off the hook for murder, but if her crimes hadn't have happened, Ricky would probably still be here. This ties Ruth to the murder of her son, and in my opinion, she never paid for that crime. The DNA evidence against James Watson was undeniable, and witness testimony during the trial left very little doubt in the minds of the jury or the public. James Watson's cocky demeanor in court was enough for the Neve sisters that sat present, awaiting a plate of justice they never thought they'd see served, and they wanted it served cold. They knew James was sick and twisted from the moment they set eyes on him. Guess you could kind of feel it in the air around him, like an invisible darkness that James tries to keep hidden from view. But if you catch him at the right angle, I think you can see it. That look alone sets off alarms. Now, I'm no expert, but... I don't see James as this ferocious ball of aggression that strikes quick. I think James is more the type to ask someone for a hug and then slowly squeeze the life out of them. If not with his hands, with sheer manipulation. It appears quite clear to me that James is some kind of narcissist who, for all the masks he wears, doesn't really have a face to call home. Believe it or not, James actually has a son. I heard he told his son he was going away for a while because of the Ricky Neve stuff. Then shortly after James was arrested for murder in 2016, he got out on bail and fled to Portugal to hide. But he didn't have a passport, so how the hell did he get there? Turns out one of his friends was driving over and hid James in the back of a motorhome to smuggle him out of the UK. After that, James posted pictures of himself relaxing on the beach. It was almost like he was taunting everyone. Watson's sister reportedly tried to get him a passport, too. But his sister swears she was only assisting her brother for the purpose of getting him back to the UK so he could turn himself in. Luckily, the Portuguese authorities arrested him on suspicion of breaching his license and eventually extradited him back to Great Britain, where he was finally forced to answer for his crimes. Crimes that surely no one in their right mind can defend because no one can bring a six-year-old boy from 1994 back to life. Reports of disturbing behavior that link James to Ricky's murder go way back to before the murder even occurred. On Friday, the 25th of November, 1994, James asked his mother if a two-year-old boy had been abducted from Peterborough before being left naked and strangled to death on Paston Parkway by the dike. He said he'd heard the details in a radio report, but his mom didn't have a clue what her teenage son was talking about. She'd never heard any report. Neither had anyone else. Then days later, Watson's radio report came true. Only it wasn't a two-year-old. It was six-year-old Ricky Neve, naked, strangled, and left on Paston Parkway by the dike, roughly 500 yards from the Neve house. Shortly after the murder, Watson became obsessed with keeping himself up to date with Ricky's story. He would even take newspapers to school to photocopy the front page and keep it like some kind of trophy. But James Watson's life displayed even more alarming forms of behavior than that. He had an unhealthy interest in animals, like killing them or taking them apart. Which is odd now, 
especially since his current Instagram page is called James Watson Animal Care. The Guardian even printed a story claiming James had been convicted of a sexual crime in the past. One thing people didn't talk about enough is how James Watson spent six years inside in 2009 for setting fire to the police headquarters in Peterborough. He caused almost a million pounds worth of damage in the city center. It seems Watson wasn't a big fan of authority. Even though there were so many things that made James look guilty, it was like he didn't think he'd actually lose the trial. He wasn't even in court during sentencing. He watched it live from a video link in prison. And the Neve family members didn't even get to read their victim impact statements. But the fate of justice in the Ricky Neve murder trial was down to the jury. After 11 weeks of trial, it took them 36 and a half hours to finally convict James Watson of murder. It was a victory, but it wasn't over. The judge said James would be sentenced as if he was a teenager, and the minimum term for his murder conviction is 12 years. Now, James has been in jail for around six years, so if he gets credit for time served, how long will they actually put him away for? We'll have to wait until he's sentenced to find out. Hopefully, he hasn't shown sympathy or leniency. James Watson should get what the scabby little shape-shifting scumbag deserves. And you may say, but Mr. Black, he hasn't killed anybody else. Since he was 13 and murdered a six-year-old boy? Why, he's been clean. Maybe he's changed. Or maybe he was abused as a kid and it's not his fault. Well, according to James Watson, he was abused. But also according to James Watson, he didn't kill Ricky Neve. We will probably never know the truth about what really happened to Ricky Neve. But I just don't feel like I'm being told the full story. I mean, maybe I'm way off and attempting to catch shadows under stones. But nevertheless, here's my theory on what could have happened in a cold and twisted world. Ruth was said to be into the occult and was reportedly running around with a man named Paul Norman, whom she believed could advance her up in the witchcraft ranks. A source even told me personally that Ruth and this man used to go have sex on top of graves. Now, I don't know much about the occult, honestly. Is there some ritual where you would bang on top of someone's grave? I don't know. But if you remember, one of the occult items that was taken from Ruth during the initial investigation in the 90s contained a picture of that Da Vinci drawing. Ricky Neve was stripped and laid out in a way to mimic that exact same pose. Later, James Watson was hiding a dead bird that was posed the same way. Hmm. James was also in Ruth's house several times, but I've never heard him comment about that, and come to think of it, I've never heard Ruth bring it up either, which is kind of odd. And according to witnesses, Ruth wanted Ricky dead. She made the statement several times, even going as far as to call social services and tell them she was going to kill him. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it possible that Ruth and James had something to do with Ricky's murder? I don't know, maybe James was seduced or coerced into what he did. I mean, the poses of the body, the bird, and the drawing all match up. And then there were the three missing buttons from Ricky's shirt. One left on a leaf for display. Two never found. Maybe they represent the two parties involved. Maybe they were used as a part of some ritual. Who knows? And what about the cop that swears Ricky's body had been moved to the place it was found? And how come the workmen saw Ricky crying the day he was killed? And why didn't Ruth go look for her son the night he went missing? Was she afraid of what she might find? Did she already know what was out there? All relevant questions in the pursuit of truth. I'm not accusing. I'm inquiring. And you might counter my theory by asking, well, why didn't James just throw Ruth under the bus during the trial? I think I know why he wouldn't. Again, this is just a loose theory. But tracing James Watson's online footsteps leads me to believe that this man is a highly self-absorbed individual. Rochelle Neve said in court it was like the James Watson show, and I think she's spot on. To me, it seems like in James's mind, he's always on stage trying to find a character that he can use to get his audience to let him creep into their space. That James Watson show ego is something James simply must hold on to. That power 
is all James has. If my theory was correct, in order for James Watson to sink Ruth Neve, he'd have to reveal the truth and confess that he killed Ricky Neve in 1994. And what good would that do? Ruth has already been found not guilty for the murder of her son. She did her seven years for the abuse. And James, with time served, will probably get somewhere around that amount too. But when he gets out, he can continue to deny what he did. And the record will always state that he never admitted to murder. So if James Watson and Ruth Neve are both involved in the murder of Ricky Neve, I doubt we'll ever know. But one thing is for sure. James Watson will be out sooner than you think, unless sentencing really turns up the heat. Ricky Neve was a boy that was described as playful, loud, and cheeky by some of the community. He was a football lover. He liked to tinker with electronics, and in school they called him Jingle Bells because he wore bells on his shoes. But his little sisters call him a hero. He snuck food into them when they were being starved by Ruth. He even tried to keep them from being beaten. But don't take my word for it. I was lucky enough to get to sit down with Ricky's sister, Rochelle, for a one-on-one conversation about her brother, her mother, and a bit of the other. I'm Mr. Black, and I'm welcoming Rochelle Neve to the disturbing truth. I think that we were let down by the police at the time. We were let down by social services. We were let down by everyone that was in our lives that were meant to care. Welcome back to The Disturbing Truth. I'm Mr. Black. If you've been keeping up with the channel lately, you've probably noticed there's a story that's come out in two parts. It's called Little Boy Who Walked With Monsters, and it's about a six-year-old child named Ricky Neve. If you haven't been keeping up or you're new here, I recommend going back and watching the two videos just before this one. For the rest of you, you know why we're here. After recording Ricky's story, I thought it would be nice to go back and talk to some of his family members about what they experienced at the hands of Ruth and how they felt when they came face to face with Ricky's killer, James Watson. I spoke to three family members, one of which was Rochelle Neve, Ricky Neve's little sister. She was three years old at the time of her six-year-old big brother's murder. Now her mother Ruth would lead you to believe that because she was three, she wouldn't remember anything. And in that case, Ruth Neve, if that's really what you think, just type in child of rage. Your excuses for why your children weren't abused, well, they won't fly here. We knew exactly what happened. Ricky Neve was a little boy who walked with monsters, one of which was his own mother. And I doubt there's anything that you or your husband Gary Rogers can say that can make me think any different. Ruth, I saw your documentary, The Mother's Story. It did not fool me. So today, we're gonna hear the sister's story. A tale of neglect, sorrow, struggle, triumph, It's got it all, and Rochelle Neve deserves to be heard. Now, without further ado, this is my interview with Ricky Neve's sister, Rochelle Neve. Rochelle Neve, welcome to The Disturbing Truth. It's important to me to speak with those who are personally affected by the horrendous crimes I cover. Hearing what you went through and learning how you coped with the murder of your brother, Ricky Neve, and the abuse you suffered can be a guiding light for other victims and survivors of the world, especially when they're stuck in the darkness themselves. Uh, you're very much appreciated here and you're welcome. It's good to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I suppose uh, everybody that's watching uh, this interview with you has just seen uh, the documentary, Little Boy Who Walked With Monsters. I wanted to ask you, why, do you know why Ricky's name was changed to Neve? Which is your father. Dean Neve would be your father. Is that correct? Yeah. Um... Personally, I think his his name was uh, Harvey, and then my birth mother married 
So um, I think she just had everyone the same. But but I think when he died, because technically I think he is a Harvey um, on paper, but because of Ruth and her surname, um, I think it was to make sure it's clarifying that it was her son that this had happened to, so that it was more um, more known, because it was more known, Neve was more known than a Harvey, you know, sort of thing. So, yeah. Okay. Did you know, uh, did, did you know R Ricky's uh, biological father? I did, yeah. Uh, not very much, obviously, um, because there was gaps between, obviously, before... I was born because I'm I'm born in ninety one, and he's born in you know eighty eighty six or eighty five, so um, yeah, it's a bit a bit of many years difference. Um, and my parents were together um, after, obviously. So um, I don't really spend much time with him now. Okay, and your in your father Dean. Um, would you have been close to him? I was as a child, yeah, because um, he more he more showed me love than Ruth ever did. Um, he'd he'd make his dinner sometimes, and he he'd, he'd never hurt me. He's he's never hurt me, but I've seen him um, assault Ricky, you know, like quite badly. Um, and and him and Ricky never got on, never ever got on. Um, there's very rare occasions that they ever got on. Um, and Ricky didn't like it because he used to come in and go and come in and go. And he felt like, well, you know, if you're going to come, stay. You know, don't, don't just keep going off, you know, you know, and leaving us in a state all the while. So... And having to deal with Ruth all the time was a bit difficult for all of us, you know, so. Do you think dealing with Ruth um, was difficult for Dean as well? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. She's a very manipulating woman. Um, yeah, she's vile with her mouth. Um, and I can imagine, um, I don't entirely know, but imagine she used this as weapons. Um because I remember, I remember a few things that she said that she she didn't want to as if he was he was not going to stay, um, and that was with me. And then two years later, she fell pregnant with my sister. So I think he felt obliged to stay around to make sure that we was going to be okay. To be honest, because um, he's got other children, and the stories I hear about him. I've never heard any really bad stories, you know. Um, I've I've heard them say, you know, he's told us off or whatever, but he's never assaulted any of them. He's never, you know, so I, I, I can't say on that part that he was a bad parent to me. But I do despise and I'll never forgive, even though he's dead, um, what he did to Ricky and how he treated him and how he spoke to him. I, I can't. Can't condone that at all. No. That's that's tough stuff to deal with. I mean, what? How old were you when, when uh, Ricky was murdered? I was three years old. Yeah. Rochelle, what do you remember about the abuse you suffered while living with your biological mother, Ruth? Oh, loads of abuse. Um, always screaming and shouting. Um, being locked in rooms. Um, for days being ignored, being assaulted, um, hit round the head, um, pulled by her hair, like we were hanging down the stairs. Like just, she told us like that, you know, is it, uh, that really hurt. Um, remember a fag being burnt out on my face, right there. If for Americans, yeah. a, a fag would be a cigarette. Um, yeah. So she, right. you're, you're, you're two or three, and and she's putting out a cigarette on your face. And yeah. what what was the reason for this kind of uh, attack? 
I don't entirely know. Um, she was a very volatile person anyway. Um, you you very rarely catch her on a good day. Um, she'd be very brutal all the time. It would be a lot of shouting, a lot of pushing you, shoving you and assaulting you. And, it, yeah, it just, it just felt like a daily nightmare. Like, I couldn't ever imagine putting a child through that myself. You know, I, I'd look at a child and think, oh, you're so cute, you know, don't do that. You know, you tell them correctly and and do that sort of thing with some sort of manner, but no, she had no manner about herself. She had no self-respect or respect for anybody else at, at all because what me and my siblings suffered, all of us, even my older sister, you know, um, she's had uh, matches put out on her hands. She's been assaulted. Um, just the list goes on. Kicked, punched. My, yeah. And you, you actually, uh, you actually witnessed your brother being held over the the bridge. Is that is that correct? What, what, yeah. How, did, so at your age, I mean, you, you must have been looking at that, thinking this is for fun. Well, this isn't. Are we next? <laughs> Jeez. So like, are we next? Like, oh my god! But, when um, Ruth did this, was there was there like. Uh, visible anger in her face? Was she emotionless? What was the purpose of holding Ricky over a bridge? He wasn't listening to what she was saying. Um, she'd asked him to do something and he didn't want to comply um, and called her every name under the sun um, and told her, you're the worst mother ever and I'm going. He basically said he's going. He, he went to walk off. And she grabbed him, said, you're not going nowhere, um, you know, swearing at him and dangled him over the bridge and, and was saying, should I drop you? Should I drop you? You know, like, I just thought, God, please don't drop me like that, you know. Like, no, is she, is she holding Ricky by his feet? Yeah, holding him by his feet, his head first, you know, and it, it was rocks. It wasn't very deep, so if he, he'd fell, it it would snap his neck or something, you know. Obviously, at that age, I didn't really know that would happen. But obviously, I know your head at that time was important, do you know what I mean? And it hurts mm -hmm. when you hit your head um, from experience. Um, but, yeah, you know, that's how she... And, and as I got older, you know, I was thinking, bloody hell, imagine if she'd have dropped him. It, it would have killed him, snapped his neck and... God, and I would have been a witness to that. And it just haunts me to this day, to be honest. I can't imagine. I can't. I really can't imagine that. Um, I've been through uh, my my own stuff and and my and my past, but um, like I can't imagine my mother ever doing something like that. I, I can't imagine it. I genuinely, I can't imagine my mother, um, even putting me in a position that would, you know, critically injure me. I mean, I got, I got spanked and stuff, but like when it, to hear that a little boy was just dangled over a bridge, like, should I drop you? Sorry, sorry, Ruth, were you threatening this kid's life, your son in front of your other kids? That's, that's insane. Yeah. yeah. That's how she used to be all the while. It, it used to be an absolute day and night where you wouldn't know whether you were coming or going, whether you wanted or not, you know, you, like you felt like you was a problem, like you was just an inconvenience to her all the time. It was, we never felt loved. We never felt cared about. It was, you know, like but we as little children were looking after the baby, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, she'd do the odd thing. Um, but most of the time, it was Ricky, Rebecca. Um, I even got a video of um, me, my younger sister, and my older sister having contact. And me and my little sister were calling my older sister mum. Wow. And that just shows that 
obviously we didn't see her Ruth as a mother figure because she wasn't doing very much for us and we didn't even though my older sister because she was young she was like eight or nine do you know what I mean and having to look mm. after two children um well two three children but Ricky was pretty independent you know he was pretty sufficient he was very bright you know there's he used to he used to go out more than Rebecca on his own, you know. So he was like the man of the house. He he felt like he was one of them that he had to go out and get these things, like go to the shop and, you know, it it protect all of his sisters because um, mm. he he just didn't want them going out there to experience. Because what we lived in was a an estate where loads of crime happened, you know. Um, yeah, just loads of crime happened, and um, and there was loads of like uh, drug abuse and dealing, and you know, and you get caught in the crossfire. Even many times we got caught in the crossfire with with stuff that was going on, arguments and stuff between my mum and the neighbours and people down the road, and and then my dad would bring trouble home as well. Um, well, in yeah, fairness, just, he 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 brought James Watson home, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Which is something that that really I can't wrap my head around. Um, uh, to your knowledge, has Ruth or James ever acknowledged or denied that 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 James was in your house? She's she's not said a word about it. She's not said because I I. As a child, and because I was about 17 when I started to uh, talk to her, um, well, she started to talk to me, and I, um, well, it wasn't talking, it was more abusing me, but um, I had an uh, I had questions and I wanted answers, and I said, you know, when I was younger, why did you do this, and why, you know, why was this, who were we around, do do you not know if you didn't do it then who did you know you've got to have known your associates you've got to have known people that could have potentially been um a predator you know and she said no to me she doesn't know who it is she doesn't know them and now to this day i think about it and i think you were clearly either off your head on drugs and not paying attention to your surroundings or two, you just denying it, so it doesn't look bad on you, you know. Like the, mm -hmm. the, 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 those two reasons, and she will never admit to me. She won't talk to me now because I don't take a crap, you know. Um, I've had much trouble from that woman, um, especially growing up um, from like the age of seventeen. Um, I had, like, people, she'd give my number out. I don't know how she got it. She must have either got it off Facebook or something. But she got my number. No, I hadn't given it to anybody that was associated with her, anything. I, it come out of the blue. First off, I had her friend phone me, saying, oh, have you got a little sister and have you got a teddy looking like this? And I was thinking, who are you? What what are you on about? Yes, I've got a little sister. I mean, what teddy are you on about? And she says, it's it's this colour, it's red, and it's got little floral flowers on. I says, how the hell do you know that? And she says, oh, uh, I'm your mother's friend, and she would love to uh, talk to you. I says, yeah, well, you can tell her. She, she's never been there for me, and, I, I, and she's not my mother anymore. I have a new mum, so... I don't have any need or want. The only thing I want is answers of why my brother is dead mm. and why she treated us in that way that she thought it was okay and everybody's going to forgive you. We're not going to forgive you. We're not We're, we're not going to just think, oh, yeah, it's all right. You went through a bad patch. You know, it wasn't a smack. That was, mm. I, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. I have been so mad at my children. And I could never imagine punching them or, mm -hmm. you know. Burning them. I'm not, no, all that. I couldn't even, I couldn't imagine it. 
You know, and it brings tears to my eyes to think that somebody thinks that's okay. That's not okay. And the thing that annoys me the most is that she needed help and she didn't take it. Everybody was offering her help, left, right and centre, the children's centre. She even phoned up social services. Yeah, they gave her minimal service, but they were still there and I blame them as well for failing the failing of us all absolutely of course if if you go to a house and you go to a house that's got a bunk bed in it with no mattresses and one bed and you have four children is that what you guys slept on i slept on the floor and if social services did their checks and they went around the house like they do. I know they do. And they go and check that the children are supposed to have the essential things. And no word of a lie, this woman says, we had toys. We had no toys. If you look in the picture of when they did the first investigation, I would like someone to explain to me where those toys are. Because when you look at the picture, there was no toys. I remember no toys. The only thing I had was a teddy. The only thing I had was a teddy, a little teddy. And I I don't remember anything else apart from going around other people's houses and playing with their things, their dolls and that, you know. And and my brother brother used to have a bag of cars, you know, that his friend's mum had given to him to take home to play with. Now, explain to me why on this TV documentary on Channel 5, that they're saying, oh, she was trying to be a mother. Um, You know, yes, they did have toys. They had things on the fridge. I don't don't remember a drawing. If those drawings were on the fridge, I don't think they would have been very appropriate drawings for a two-, three-year-old and a six-year-old and a seven... uh, how old was she? Eight or nine? Eight or nine? I don't think they would have been appropriate drawings. You know, they wouldn't have been. Oh, I love you, mummy. They wouldn't have been none of that. They wouldn't have been little hearts or little stars. They, they would have been complete mess. Mm. You know, very traumatic scenes that we've seen, and probably reenacting it on the paper and showing on the paper what what we're seeing. And I. I I don't ever remember drawing my mum a picture saying, I love you. I've never done it, ever. Were you ever, were you contacted by Channel 5 to be part of that documentary? They tried to um, in in court, which I was very, I was very upset. Um, They tried to. Did you say in, in court or they called? No, in court. Okay. We come out the court. And um, I went. I went to go to the toilet, and um, someone stopped my little sister. And I was standing there for a minute, thinking, "Who, you know, who is this?" And she was. She was very because I can read my sister. She was mm. like, obviously, her body language was like, "Well, I don't know you, so I, I don't know." And so I walked over and I says, "And who are you?" And he says, "Oh, I'm. I'm from here." Um, and um, I just wondered if you wanted to do an interview and um, about the case. And he says, oh, and who are you? I says, we're family. Um, and I don't think this is a very appropriate time to be talking about any sort of media, any sort of thing. You know, we are in the middle of a trial. Well, we're near the end of a trial. And all you can think about is writing a story, you know, mm. um, and wanting input from... No, no, I don't want to be part of it. May I said maybe after um, I'd, look at, I'd look at it because everything between the media and myself, I always look at it because they want contracts, they want, you know, like the BBC mm. and, all, you know, they, they all want contracts and I want to see what they're going to put out there and, you know, um, and what the deal is. And no, there was none of that. Um, but I think they'd started recording it before um, it 
before the trial and in between the trial. So I think they were doing it whilst the trial was going on. Right. And my main priority was not a bloody TV programme. It was No, it of was, course not. You know. Your whole life had been building up to this trial and the outcome yeah. of it. The last thing you wanted to do would be, you know, yeah. talk every to Channel 5 or anybody. Yeah, every day I was went to that court waiting for a verdict. I was sweating. I was dripping. I was I was crying. I was I just I just thought in my mind I thought if I've come here and I've dragged all my past up and I've heard so much of my past that's hurt me so bad and affected me in this this way how am I going to feel if we get guilt uh, not guilty it's going to ruin me it's it, it's mm-hmm. going to it's I'm going to have to restart it all again and yeah. relive it all again I just want it to be over that's just what I wanted it to be to be over so that I can in some in some way I want to close that chapter I want to close it off and I want to not not forget about my life before but you know obviously take parts of that of me and my brother and my siblings and stuff with me but I just wanted to move on from my past and make sure that no other child has to go through what my brother went through and no other family has to feel. Siblings, you know, obviously some mothers actually care. So, you know, mothers and fathers, if they ever had to go through what my brother went through, um, it, it, yeah, I just didn't want that at all. And not just was, your brother. Really... No, not just your brother. You, you all. I mean, do do any yeah, of Ruth's just... children speak to her? No. No, well, that says um, a lot, doesn't it? My little sister tried to because she she was naive like me when I was younger. She was like, "I'm going to get answers. I'm I'm going to find out a little bit. You know, I'm going to try." It's understandable. And, you know, I I want to know her, but obviously at a distance. You know, I said that's fine. But I'm going to warn you, you know, she's very manipulative. And she always said to me, when I argued with her, she she said to me, well, I'll get to your little sister. And I said, I said to her, as long as I'm alive, I promise you, you will never get to her. You will never affect her in the way that you affected us when we were younger. Because you can't do that to me anymore. And you realise you can't do that to me anymore. And you don't like it. Mm. And I make sure that she does not endure the suffering and the abuse and the emotional abuse and the physical abuse that you did to us, you know. And she was like, don't be silly. It was social services making up all this and social services did a good job of splitting us up. And I said, no, you did that yourself. You know, the way you used to treat us. Don't blame anybody else. Blame yourself of what yeah. you've done. You can't even admit what you've done wrong. You can't. Well, so the thing, she did admit yeah. and she asked for forgiveness from, from you. And then she turned around and said it didn't happen and tried to be the hero campaigning for Ricky's case. And that fucking pisses me off. Sorry, pardon my my language, but that really, really angers me. Uh I look at your your biological mother, and I just don't see a human in there. I'm, I don't. No, I don't. I, there's no love. But she says she can say words, but it, not very well. Like in the press conference, in the press conference, it was like when she came out to campaign for for to figure out what happened to Ricky. It was as if she was. It was a very strange sight because it was as if she was being guided by her husband but at the same time she's manipulating him that was parallel yeah. and it's obvious and she doesn't <laughs> she's not even she's reading what's been written probably by him or or someone um and she's reading what's been written on this paper and she's going ricky was a lovely boy and you know he just uh, blah, blah. and it's like but you don't feel that how no. can you say that if you you from what i've read she medically doesn't feel empathy or much empathy so how can you say that 
that you feel that because you don't. It's clear. It's obvious in the way you roll your eyes and the, your little yeah, head jerk movements. Yeah, she, she's done that all, all her life. The only time you I know? see a, a genuine emotion in Ruth is when she's being defensive. And then that emotion, uh, as I said in the, uh, the video, is, is anger. It's rage, mm. actually. It's not even anger. It's rage. That's what mm. I see. Yeah. I totally agree. She's a very angry woman. Um, and even she did a video on my brother's birthday. And she's got this balloon. It's on her Facebook page. My sister showed me. But I seen this video and she was standing in the back garden. And it was like she had this balloon in her hand. And it was, there's to my boy. You know, oh. I just thought. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Was that for like his 30th birthday or something? <laughs> yeah. I just thought, who on earth does that? You know, you, you, me, I'd be in bits. Mm. I wouldn't be able to get any words out of my mouth. I'd have someone talk for me. You know, if that was my son, mm -hmm. I'd say, you know, I would have written something up and someone else would read it, uh, read it out. And that was just insulting. I just thought, mm -hmm. oh, my God. And I think she's taken all this medication and drugs or whatever, um, and she's doing these things online so that she doesn't get in trouble for lying. Because mm -hmm. if you look at some, some interviews that she's done, where's the crutches? Where's... Where, where's her like oh you know like how she was in the um channel uh four or was it channel four four yeah, or five it was something channel five no channel five it was um that channel five was absolutely i was shocked i was like why would you even do that to yourself i was you surprised like that they're pandering to her as well i, I was yeah. just like, hold on, guys. She was convicted. She admitted it. A team of professionals, neighbors, witnesses, her own children all have uh, vouched for the fact that she was abusive. And now suddenly she isn't. She's a doting mother and we should support this mother. What? Yeah. She says, oh, I used to dress him up like Bob the Builder. Now, when my brother died, Bob the Builder wasn't even out. Yeah. See, <laughs> it's things like that. That she says, and then like when James Watson says, oh, I lifted him up over the fence. Okay, cool. The fence that wasn't there till a long time yeah. later. These yeah. these lies. And 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 I feel like a lot of people just aren't seeing this or it's just not publicized enough. But these lies should be um, taken to heart by everyone. A little bit. They don't know the full story and they don't know us. They don't know Ruth. They just, they just see a little boy. Um, that's been murdered and James Watson has been found and oh no it's not the mother but yep. actually I don't think they realise that how much abuse she put her children through um, in order for you to be accused of murdering your own child there's got to be some grounds evidence, there's got to be evidence to say that you treated your children like that they, they didn't mm. come at Ruth for no reason I mean she she wanted to kill Ricky. She said it many times. I mean, I believe she even wrote letters to your dad in prison. Is that not correct? That that she she wanted to kill either herself or Ricky. And it's like she said that my older sister was beating him up and she was enjoying it. And I thought, how oh, can you when my kids fight, it hurts my heart. Mm -hmm. I'm like, can you just love each other? You know, why yeah. have you got to do this? And then you go and stop it and you separate them. No, she just leaves them to it. Just mm -hmm. leave us to argue and chuck his, you know, chucking things around the house and and how she gets her sherbet. Yeah, yeah. her drugs. Yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to know what, what she actually was taking. I read that it was amphetamines. My dad was an amphetamine head as well. Um okay. I've heard from Obviously, I won't mention any names, but sure. other other people who have been with him in the past, um, mm. you know, friends or 
certain family members yeah so I have heard that he was really bad on it um which yeah like I said I can't condone because Mm -hmm. a parent when you have children your life changes you know you're not just you you've got to think about the dangers of that if you're leaving that around if you drop any and you come mm-hmm. in in a state, it, you know, you've got to think about all these things. Even when you come in drunk, yeah, you know, you don't get in your child's bed for certain things, you know, mm-hmm. like you don't go and give them a cuddle just in case you fall on them or you, do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? But none of that was registering in, in these, these people's brains. Mm-hmm. Well, something clearly took priority over it um, with Dean, w- with your with your father. I, I assume that that was probably um, his habit, his dependency. Mm-hmm. Um, and with Ruth, I would say it was that, but also just this lack of empathy. She she clearly uh, doesn't have humanity in there. And the yeah. fact that your mother, her thinking was, who should I kill me or my son? What are you? Yeah, what are you? Yeah. What have you become? Now, definitely i would uh, i would say that um ruth's what she is 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 a product of what you know her environment growing up i I believe that's probably the case but that doesn't mean once you make someone else the victim you give up your right to be a victim no matter who you are yeah so i i could say that i could say oh i'm a product of of my surroundings my my past but i'm not yeah exactly i if I sat there and said, oh, you know, oh, but my mum did this to me, so why I'm going to do that to you. Mm, exactly. Who would I be? Who the hell would I be to do that A to monster. Myself? Exactly. Do you know what I mean? So I don't want to be, I don't want to be associated with her. I don't want to be, I don't want my family name rubbed in the dirt. You know, I, I was a victim but it doesn't mean that I have to go and inflict that pain on anybody else. hundred percent. And that's always how I've been. Um, growing up, I was an angry child and I, I did used to get into trouble and, and yeah, in some cases it was, I didn't know how to deal with my emotions mm. and I, I was using drugs. I was drinking and, I, you know, I, I blame a lot of that on me trying to block my past out. Now, when I got to, about, I think it was about 13, 14, like, things started to change in my life. I wanted to, you know, I needed to make sure that I was going to get an education and that that I, I used to see people around me. And I, they'd remind me of my mum. And I just thought, well, I don't want to be like that. So the fact that you were able to realize that on your own and implement that in your life after what you've went through, because don't forget at the age that uh, at the age you were when the abuse occurred, you, that's what you learned. You learned mm-hmm. that stuff. You didn't learn the love. You didn't learn it later. Mm-hmm. So it's amazing Nothing. that you were able to do it. And and on that note too, I meant to bring this up earlier. Um, I, I saw that, that Ruth um, had tried to say, Oh, Oh, Rochelle, you were, you were th- you were three or four or whatever. What what would you what do you remember? Well, she really kind of put herself in a shitty corner when she said that. That's a terrible re- reason to claim somebody wasn't abused because I don't know if you've heard of Beth Thomas. I bring her up a lot. I'm going to do a story on her. Uh, Beth Thomas was a she was a five or six when she was interviewed, um, but when she was I think between like the ages of like one and two. Um, her, her dad had abused her and her brother really bad, so bad that I think they were even abandoned and just left in a house and, you know, left to die. But they were they were sexually abused very bad. Was that the one that um, she was trying to harm her brother? Yes. 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 Yeah, what happens there um, is you, 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 you literally learn this. Mm. Instead of love, something else takes its place. So yeah. you've got this other thing minus the love. Um, mm-hmm. And she wanted to harm everybody from the animals, from herself. Um, she was sexually deviant. And you're going, hold on a second. She was like a year, year and a half when this abuse occurred. How could this have affected her so bad? Because those are prime times for things to affect you. But you climbed out of that. You broke that cycle. And so did Beth in the end up. But for Beth, it took a very, very um, 
uh, strong, rigorous routine to break that. I mean, she had to go to a place that's for kids that are experiencing that. She had what was called RAD, reactive attachment disorder. So, um, and she's grown up to be, uh, to write books, I think, and, and speak and, and help other people change their life, which is really, really amazing. You are the Neve legacy, not Ruth. Yeah. She's not even a blood Neve. That's you. No. You know, yeah, it's the me. good that you do. You are the Neve name. It doesn't have to be Ruth. You know, no. so I, I, I'm proud of you personally, and I don't Thank even you. know you. So it's, it's, it's awesome. It's fucking really awesome to be fair. Um, I'd like to ask you um, if you have any memories about James Watson when you were young. To be honest, no, I don't. Um, I remember a lot of kids coming in and out, um, but I don't particularly remember him which is very strange which I remember a lot from mm. back then but um no I don't I don't remember that um but the one thing that did um make me very puzzled is when he was in the dark he was just smiling at me. Is that in court? Is that like in the, um, is that where he would have sat in court? Yeah, he was in his little box. He sits okay. in his little box and we sit at the back. But what he was doing was looking in the glass and smiling at me. He wasn't doing it to my younger sister. He was doing it to me. And I felt very unnerved and I felt something triggered off in my mind. And I'm thinking, has this guy been in my house and maybe done something to me that he's sitting there and thinks that I can't remember because I was too young and I've blocked it out? Because as child trauma, certain things that happen to you, you block out. And I've re I really did feel that. And the way he looked at me like that felt like you must have tried to harm me as well. And I think he got to my brother because my brother was protecting us mm. as, as children, um, as little girls, do you know what I mean? And because my brother was the protector and I have a feeling he got into an argument and James took a dislike into that. And uh, yeah, that's how, how I feel. Um. I'm no detective. I don't have any training in this stuff, but um, I have this feeling because there was testimony from workmen that saw Ricky that day that, that mm. claimed, you know, they asked him what was wrong because he looked upset and he started crying and ran off. And I have this feeling that James may have assaulted him and had been chasing him basically, you know, but then they say there was also testimony from a cop that said uh, he swore that Ricky's body was moved to where it was found. And I just think there's a lot. But the thing with that is the failings in the first police case. Why is there only one police officer? And now this is what people have got questions and stuff. Why is there only one police officer saying this? To try and cover their, their tracks, that they didn't search properly. That's, mm. that's how I feel. Because okay. otherwise they'd all be standing in the line and saying, no, the body wasn't there, you know. We we did an extensive search. They didn't search properly. They did not oh. search properly. They walked okay. past. They walked past my brother's dead body through some trees. They walked past it, and then they went back, and then they found him. and And that's where they're trying to cover up. Like, no, we know it wasn't there. It must have been put there. No, no, it was always there. You just missed it, and you can't mm. sit there and say, you know what. I didn't actually look properly over that side because I didn't think there was any reason to. So mm. really, I think that police officer was trying to cover up the tracks from the failed uh, police investigation in the first place. Because yeah, that, you could be right about that. And then I find out that they'd lost the clothes. They'd lost my brother's clothes. How? I went crazy. I thought... How the hell do you lose 
a murder child's clothes. That is significant to the case. So you're telling me now, I'm, I'm looking back at it, I'm thinking, are we ever going to get justice for this? You know, because what have we got now? Now we've got mm. to find a witness to say that this person killed so-and-so, you know? I read myself that uh, James uh, James was... Uh, even at the age of 13, was somewhat forensically uh, knowledgeable. Um, which, how, how? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, why would you be? <laughs> how would you be at 13? I mean, I know there was the rumor that his, his dad was a cop, but I mean, that was a lie, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. That was a lie because I had an argument at a meeting um, with the Cambridgeshire police. And he says, well, I don't know about this. I'd, I'd have to get back to you. And it took them ages to get back to me about it. But they did say in the end that, no, he wasn't, he wasn't actually a police officer. That was a cover-up for James to, to try and make people, persuade people's mind and the jury's mind. Say, well, oh, well, how come a police officer's son got into so much trouble like that? You know, like why? Why would they do that? Why would they kill someone mm. if they're dead, the police officer? Do you know what I mean? And was James' dad? Was he in fact a paedophile? He was a paedophile. Wow. He abused him. He sexually abused him, and then James carried on. Yeah. He sex. He sexually abused his family members. He sexually abused other people's sons. Obviously, I, I can't. Ricky's friend. Him. Yeah, I can't mention names, but that's that's fine. You yeah. know, that horrifies me. Mm. That the fact that you've got to thirteen years old, or even eleven, I think it was eleven years old, and you're doing that to little boys, and we don't know whether he was doing that to little girls as well. Yeah, you know, um, that's true. You don't, and that's alarming. That. Because I know I've been at 13 years old, I was sexually abused. And I I took it from my point of view and I thought, God, you know, you wouldn't want to do that to someone. What the hurt and the pain, the, you know, the self-respect it takes away. It, it takes away a lot of confidence. It takes away, it ruins someone's life. You know, why would you want to go? You've you've had it done to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the same with the neglect and the abuse. You've had it done to yourself. Why would you inflict that pain on somebody else? Like, you know how it feels. But obviously, mm -hmm. people are, are cold and they, they don't care about people's feelings. They don't care that they're going to hurt people along the way. That They didn't care about anybody's um, worth or yeah. continuing their life and... You know that how that's going to affect them. They don't, they don't think like that. They just don't care because they're callous, and you know they just want what they want, and and that's how it is. If someone's, um, let's say, sexual stimulant is murdering little boys, well, you you aren't going to change that, and that's scary. That's really yeah. scary. You're never changing that. No. It becomes like any any kind of fetish or, or sexual uh, preference with somebody that becomes their thing. And I, I, I do believe that that's what, what James Watson's thing was. Um, I question all the time, whether or not he actually sexually assaulted Ricky. Um, I have no clue, but. Um, well, physically, I can't say that the only swab that they did um on his body, on his dead body, was um, anally. And that came back that there was nothing, that no DNA, no thing. But he could have tried to touch him. Um, and I, and I, I do believe that, that he did try to touch him. And my brother wouldn't have had it. My brother would have said, no, get the hell off me. Yeah, you know, he was a little tank too. Yeah. He, Ricky was Dude, a... I'm yeah. going to go and tell so and so, or I'm going to go and tell, I'm going to go and get someone. This is not right, you know, because he, he, he wouldn't let anybody touch him. And this is what made me think when James said, Oh, I picked him up. I, he wouldn't have let you pick him up. 
he wouldn't have let you pick him up. He was very limited with contact with people. He'd be very funny. He wouldn't just walk up to someone and start a conversation because that's mm-hmm. that's not how he was. He was he was very um he was streetwise, you know. He was like, don't talk to strangers, like generally. And he'd more talk to neighbours, um, his friends at school's mums, stuff like that. He he mm. he would talk to them, but anybody out of that circle, no, he wouldn't have let he didn't want it. Mm. And I, I know that because I, I seen him do it because he used to he used to drop drugs off for my mum. And he used to take me with him and he used to post things through letterboxes. And then basically what he'd do is around he'd post them and then come back 10, 15 minutes later, and then he'd, he'd collect the money. Sometimes he used to leave it in the milk thing in the envelope or whatever, or he'd knock on the door and he'd get it, you know, them sort of things. And nine out of 10, he didn't even speak to these people. Mm. He didn't even speak to these people because he didn't know them. Yeah. You know, so I... And and certain situations like we'd be walking down the street and someone would say to him, you know, Oh hi, you know, how are you? And he'd just look like in disbelief, like, why are you talking to me? Mm. <laughs> he'd be like, I don't know you. And he he'd say, I don't know you, go away. You know, like, yeah. I'm not engaging with you. Do you recall at that at at uh, in the nineties when when it happened, do you recall uh, hearing the news that your brother was murdered, or where your mother was, your brother was dead. Even when I got adopted, they tried to shield us from that, mm. um, and they didn't really want anything to because I'd already got problems. They didn't want to cause any more problems and and bring up bad memories for myself. Mm. Um. And she used to say to me, my adopted mum, she used to say to me, yeah, the, the, the things you used to say, the things you used to do, um, it will never leave It will never leave me. It haunts me, the things that you used to say and the way you used to act and um, you used to flinch all the time. My mum now would, would come to hug me and I... I'd reject her because I was used to rejection and not used to the loving. It took me many years, even up until my teenage years, to accept sort of that calm, loving woman that she is. And I've only, I've only just started letting certain people in, you know. Um, and it's it's took lots of people supportive people in my life that have from professionals that have actually improved my emotional side of things because I didn't know how to deal with them people would look at it's like I used to have conversations with the social worker and she'd say obviously I've read a little bit about you um what would you like to tell me you know who are you and I'd say yeah you know, this is what happened to me, child abuse, and I was adopted, and then my dad's dead, and everything that I, I used to say to her, she just started crying. And I'd look at the woman like, why are you crying? You know, like, as a child, mm. like, I wouldn't be emotionally there. Potentially, the love you felt from Ricky and, and, and maybe your, your sisters or whoever, Maybe that is what gave you the strength to be able to initiate breaking the the circle when you were older. Yeah, the love that I got from my brother, definitely. Mm. I know yes. you've got to get moving and and uh, thirty to forty five minutes to pick your kids up. So um, I'll move on with the questions so that I don't want to keep you keep you waiting. Yeah. Um, but there are some we, things that mm. just before we do, and this this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about, like the book. Can you see that? Oh. Wow. Oh. Wow. Did you make this yourself? No, this was given to me. Right, okay. 
things like that. Um, uh, yeah, there's so many. Um, that was one with Vicky's dad. Wow, that's Trevor. Yeah, that's Trevor there. Yeah. And that was that. Is that his dad in the background? Yeah, that must be his dad. Yeah. So he was the one that actually would have come and lift pick, picked Ricky up and taken him to his house. Yeah. yeah. He he was quite gutted whenever the, Ricky was murdered, wasn't he? Yeah. The, he the was. grandfather. Yeah. yeah, and and his dad. You know, it, it ruined his yeah. dad totally. Yeah. yeah. He, he was never. He, he was never the same. Did um, Trevor? Did Trevor? Um, uh, not to be insensitive about this, but did did Trevor walk out on the family, or did Ruth keep Ricky from Trevor? Ruth kept Ricky from Trevor. Mm, okay. Um, so she actually, probably changed Ricky's name to Neve, maybe to get at Trevor a little bit. Then more than likely, yeah. So do you feel uh, Ricky's a Neve or a Harvey, honestly? To me, he's always been a Neve, but mm. technicality, his dad was a Harvey. So, yeah. Okay. But I, I'd say it was double barreled because <laughs> me. Just, a hy- just put a hyphen name in there and we'll be, we'll be good, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because obviously we've got two different dads, but the same mom. So... Both of them go really, you know. But I've, mm. I've always known him as Ricky Lee. That's all I've ever known him as. So when when Ruth was acquitted, and well, even though she was acquitted, do you still feel as though she's somewhat responsible for your brother's death, your brother's murder? Most definitely, because if she hadn't have neglected him like that, he wouldn't have been walking the streets. He wouldn't have been. Um, been accessible to sick people like that i'd I'd love to know wh- what it was like the f- like i mean you there must have been a moment in like uh, maybe the courtroom maybe on the way to court something where you laid eyes on james watson for the first time maybe there was eye contact there was a moment what did you feel was there fear or rage or anger or what what happened there what what were you i just wanted to get my hands on him I thought yeah I just I just wanted to grab him around the neck and just mm-hmm. do it for him you know in, uh, but I just feel like even if I did it it's an easy way out for him yeah of course you know because he's now got to live with the title of that of a child killer you know um, I want I wanted to believe that he hadn't done it it was part of me that wanted to believe that he hadn't done it and that there was some evidence that were going to come out to say that he didn't do it. You know, to in some sort of way, I felt like it would have made, it made the situation hard for me to deal with, but in a way that I just, I just can't believe a 13-year-old would do them things. But, you know, I, I didn't want to believe that that was the case so much was overlooked i mean there was where well, there was evidence so much evidence at the time linking james to it um and and i could understand possibly people thinking oh well this this 13 year old couldn't have done it i could understand that if it if ricky neve's murder hadn't been what two years after the james bolger murder yeah so people should have been on high guard james should have been properly investigated i think not just a, a testimony or whatever he gave in the 90s but this really should have been looked into i mean his behavior at school the accusations la- uh lobbied against him um yeah. the fact that he was in your house um mm-hmm. i mean he had what molested one of uh ricky's friends as well a five-year-old yeah. um and and that was said basically in, by the police well we're, we're going to keep that on record just in case you do it again Hey, whoa, we don't wait till it's done again. We handle no, this now. Before it happens again, yeah. Just feels like as you, I, in the intro to the video, um, the end of the intro ends with you speaking, 
where you said that you were let down by everybody and you really were, you were just surrounded on by every angle of just complete letdowns. And you came out just a queen. You, you came out a queen that helps other people, which is what you do now. You, you, you have, is it, is it called the Ricky Neve foundation? Well, it's actually called at the minute, the Ricky Neve campaign 2015, okay. but this year I'm going to change it to a foundation because I, I, I still run things through that, like a mentorship program and like sort of for child abuse victims or suicide, mental health, um, a lot of sort of things that, that people might not want to talk to people they know. They just want to talk to someone that, well, is experienced in a lot of things and can pinpoint you to the right direction and how I did it and what my experiences was because I'm quite open with people. A lot of a lot of my clients I'm quite open with, you know, and I say you're not alone. You know, this happened to me. Mm. Uh, I felt like this and this is how I dealt with it. You know, it, it is hard. It's not easy. It's not an easy road, but you've got to you've got to manifest a positivity because as soon as you get into a negative um, way of thinking, it it just spirals out of control and you have no control over it, and it just gets worse and worse. Yeah, it doesn't so the, go away. No, it doesn't go away, and it and like I've I've experienced myself, like I I've had mental health issues all my life. Like I've I've got a um personality disorder. Um and I've got um a di- attachment disorder. And then three years ago, um I I'd never suffered it ever in my life before, but I was psychotic. Um, wow. and that was a real what like eye opener for me. Like, I'd I'd heard about all these things about psychotic people and psychoticness, and um, but I hadn't actually learned properly about it until it's to me it was until I went through it. But yeah, I actually actually tried to kill myself because I I just couldn't cope with anything anymore. Um, my life was, my past was catching up with me, um, in every direction possible. You know, I I want to I want to live my life. I do want to live my life, but inside my brain, my brain is not functioning right right now, and I need I need help, and and so I did I did try to strangle myself, and that's when they sectioned me, um. And it and it unfortunately runs in the family, um, like suicide and mm. things like that, mental health, and it runs a lot through the family from mother to father, sisters to cousins to it, it runs right the way through. Even your grandparents, I believe, died in a suicide pact. Is that correct? Yeah, that was right. Yeah. Yeah, they tried I mean, you, multiple times to do it. They actually killed themselves when they was, um, I think Ruth was about 24 when they actually killed themselves. Um, yeah, because they, they gave her up to social services, yeah. But yeah, wow. I actually, when I was sectioned, I had to be medicated. And... Um, because I was hearing voices of enemies and people that I felt that were bad. It was like hearing evil. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't get away from it. And then at the medication, it took me two and a half weeks. of Because um, I used to smoke a lot of cannabis as well. Um, from God, from the age of like 10. And it never, ever wow. affected me. It never affected me in that any that way I never seen it as like that but I feel like and I, I do want to make people aware like they do say yeah it's a plan 
get. We all know that. But nowadays, the modified cannabis, like skunk and stuff, is chemicalized. Specifically skunk. You're 100% right. I, you know, it's funny you say that. I just spoke with a doctor from... Uh, and sorry to interrupt you and cut you off like that, um, yeah. but it does pertain to what you're what you're saying. Um, on the, on the one of the last episodes I did about Peter Bryan, a guy from the UK, um, I brought in a doctor, Doctor Das, great doctor from uh, a psych for sore eyes. He worked in Broadmoor and everything, um, okay. and he spoke to me exactly about that. That um, skunk is a big problem for um, uh, for for some people, especially if you have some uh, some different types of you know mental illness in your, in your history. Um, yeah. I've seen myself, people smoke skunk specifically, and there's this temporary psychosis almost takes over. So yeah. I agree with you. That's something you should stay away from skunk. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, me, I'm, I'm three years clean. I don't, I don't smoke it at all. Um, but yeah, I'd advise anybody that is homegrown. If you know where it's coming from and it's not chemicalized, sure. You know, me, I don't judge people, but the skunk, I feel, when I smoked that, because I, I did an experiment, because I wanted to know, because people were saying, no, it is it is the cannabis, and I was like, no, I've been smoking it this long, it can't, it can't be, you know, I was in disbelief, like, how can it just a plant do this to me? There's modifications, there's... There's all there's all kinds of stuff that 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 makes it differently. It's probably molecularly different as well, you know. Yeah, well, they're spraying all sorts of chemicals on it, but mine was I was really paranoid and uh, traumatized. Um, all all it was like a it was like a mental breakdown, but it was everything like hearing thousands of voices, hundreds of voices, mm. just from my past, and it was just horrible. I, I would never wish that on, on my worst enemy, sure. like that. Um, but after being medicated, it went away. And like I said, when I came back out, I thought, oh, well, I'll just have a cheeky one, you know, and I'll, I'll just see how I feel after smoking it. No, I will never mm -hmm. touch it again. <laughs> it actually gave me, like, I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. Like, I only smoked, like, three, four drags of it and I was like shaken I was like oh my god yeah. oh. and it clearly was and that was my proof to myself I had to prove it to myself because you know anybody could say the sky is blue and it's gray you know mm. so you have to you have to see these things for yourself and and that's sure. what I think for myself. yeah you, you've clearly seen something that um as a negative effect on you and it's not healthy for you at all. And you, you shouldn't do that. You definitely shouldn't. Uh, personally, I, I do, I vape weed. Um, uh, but, I I'm very, uh, <laughs> careful with what I get. Um, yeah. but if that affected me in any way negatively, uh, and it could be linked, linked directly to that, I would stop. And anyone should same as some people can go out and they can have a drink or two. And then some people cannot do that. No, <laughs> without yeah. getting into trouble or opening yeah. the mouth too much. <laughs> I used to be the same. It's like um, growing up, I used to drink a lot of vodka and like uh, brandy. But I was realising that when I'm drinking these things, that I'm getting into, you know, all sorts of altercations. Thinking, and and I'm, I'm really emotional. I'm really angry. So I was mm -hmm. like, right, okay. So... Oh. This is what we're going to do. We're not going to drink those. We're going to change to a different drink. We're going to change to, I don't know, what did I have? Uh, like Jägermeister or or Malibu, like rum, stuff like that. I don't, it has completely different effects on me. I'm quite happy. I'm quite um, sociable. I'm, I've been there too. And, and, and I wonder why that is. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know personally why it is, but I think... Vodka is very, and brandy, they're very, very strong. Isn't it odd that so many people say the same thing? Like, oh, I can drink whiskey, but I can't drink gin or, mm -hmm. or vice versa. And I, I wonder what the, the, the science behind that is. As you say, maybe it's just the strength. You know, Malibu's much, much lighter, isn't it? You know? Well, everybody's different. Everybody's body is different. Everybody's DNA is different. Everybody's body chemical levels different. Because otherwise we'd all 
be the same, look the same, and whatever else, wouldn't we? If we if mm. we didn't have different different chemicals and and also like different things that have happened in life, like trauma or certain people like have alcoholic mums or dads, like they could have been. Because I know that when I was a child and I was born, I was um, addicted to amphetamine because obviously my mum took amphetamine while she was pregnant with us. Oh, right. And and I realised even when I was older, um, I I wouldn't say older, older, but I was about about 14, 13, 14, and I, I... experimenting with drugs and amphetamine is one speed and and things like that I realized that all my friends only had to have a little bit see whereas me I had to have a lot like my tolerance level to those things was absolutely ridiculous like so I could eat like I used to take um ecstasy and I used to I used to take like seven or eight eight pills in one night and my friends would be my friend god how how do you do that like i mashed off one or two (laughs) and like they're like like, yeah it's 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 odd that you say that uh i had similar experience where you know um people were having a little just a little bit of something and then me i don't know it's like you could have went all night could have went all night, yeah. looked still looked fresh in the morning, all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know yourself that that's not a that's not a road that's going to lead you to anywhere nice. Same as people who say, no. "Oh, I, I can't get drunk. I don't get drunk enough. I'll, I'll never pass out." That's not good. It's not a good. It seems no, cool when you're 22, good. but no, that's how you turn into an alcoholic. <laughs> yep. And yeah, that's not a good look. <laughs> not a not something to brag about. It seems it seems cool when you're in your twenties, but be careful with that. If you if you think you're one of those, or another one is if you're drinking and and you have blackouts, gaps in your memory where you never remember things, or or you won't remember that section at all. You really need to examine your your um your 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 drinking uh, routine or habits, and especially with like drugs now today. Like people mix everything with everything. I can't imagine taking drugs now. Um, no, especially not. with some of the cases I've covered where, you know, girls thought they were taking something and there turned out to be like fentanyl in it or something like, yeah, that's terrifying, you know? So I can't, yeah, I can't imagine doing drugs today. Um, some homegrown weed. Yeah, fair enough. But, um, I, I'm glad that all that, that stuff is, 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 was in my twenties and it wasn't, it, yeah. I didn't do it major. I wasn't, you know, uh, your, your typical sort of partying, partying sort of uni kid in the UK, I would say I, I, w- I was around that that kind of level um, and luckily had had good experiences and stuff and, and came out and became became a real adult at some stage <laughs> and put all that behind me. So, um, yeah, uh, but I know I know we're running uh, low on time, uh, Rochelle. So I just have a couple questions I'd like to to ask you. I wonder during the trial, James Watson's trial, um, Ruth testified on the stand, didn't she? Yeah, she did. Well, she How? did it behind video. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, she did it. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose it, that's a little easier to see than her right there well, in real life. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. apparently I'm going to have to see her next week. Is it next week? The 24th of July. Apparently I'm going to have to see her next week, which I'm not too happy about. But June or July? Yeah, June. Yeah, June. Oh, is it is the sentencing on the twenty fourth? Yeah, and she's not been to any of the trial. Really, I was the only person who turned up on the first day of the trial to make sure that my brother's case was going to go, and it was ready, and it was the jury sworn in. I needed to know that. I needed to, you know, I wanted closure. And for myself and my family, but also for the community, you know, like who wants this person running around doing these things, you know? So I wanted to make sure that it was all up and running. And I I attended most weeks, 
um obviously I have children so mm -hmm. it was about working around that and finding babysitters and um and she doesn't of, have yeah. children she's got a, no. a live-in a live-in wed in chauffeur to drive her around and put his hand on her shoulder and she wasn't there yes. on the first day of the trial she was campaigning for for the justice yeah. she was seeking and she wasn't even there yeah well, I don't believe she was campaigning. That's why I, I started my page and I started um, because I thought, well, who's going to listen to her? And this is about a little boy that needs justice and I need people to listen because it's not about her. It's about him. And it's about that that person is living their life and could have done it to many of the families mm -hmm. and I, it just wasn't sitting right with me. I, no. I just thought, well, well, I'm going to have to take it, bump it up a bit and set my own page up and go start from that. And then I, I did leaflets, um, which I had people, volunteers, um, which they did free for nothing. Um, they said either post me them and I will just dis distribute them. Um, which I, I, I got the leaflets printed out myself um, and I, I walked the streets. I walked, I walked for hours just talking to thousands of people that were so lovely and so understanding. Um, and I had lots of support online. Um, I connected with a lot of people who were fighting for justice for another family member of their own, um, which, like, gave me advice and things to do and how they did it, you know, and how how they go about it and how they deal with it. Um, so I had a lot of support from a lot of people. Um, the idea was that if there was any missing sort of information, that even someone, someone could be in a different country, someone could be in a different city... I did all over the UK, all over it, Birmingham, Manchester, up to the top. You know, I had people, I was sending packages, paying out of my own money to send for people to distribute around the UK because I thought anybody could be anywhere because I've moved around a lot. You know, like you, you could have been there at that time in, in the 90s, but now you're the other side of the UK or you've left yep. the country and you live in Spain or you know I, I had it all over the place Portugal Spain um Ireland everywhere because I have friends that live in Northern Ireland and Ireland Isle of Wight everywhere you know we just need to be aware of those dangers and and that those things that these people will go out and do Unfortunately, that's another big key to the disturbing truth is, is awareness for that. Not only that, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, uh, a lot of victims or people who've been through stuff, survivors even could be yeah. a better word. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them need to know they're not alone. <clears throat> and these stories remind them that they're not. Um, you did all these things for your brother. You 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 pretty much went on tour, and yeah, and in yeah. pursuit of justice for Ricky Neve. Ruth, I feel, would want people to believe that Ricky Ricky's case was reopened and his killer was found because she campaigned for it. But I get the feeling that she may have caught wind that the case was going to rise back up and decided to coat tell on the back of it to make herself look good. That's exactly what do you think? What that's exactly what happened because I knew they were going to open the case way before she did. Mm. Do you know what age I knew? No. 18 years old. Wow. 18 that, years it, old. Was that because it was the 10 year? So, so they had to kind of review it again to see if techniques yeah. have updated enough to test for things. Is, is that what happened? Yeah. So that yeah, was, they were basically. gonna they were gonna re they were at least gonna re-examine Ricky's case regardless of Ruth. They do, yeah, they were, yeah. Um, and I was the first to phone up, um, and they even stated that to me myself. Um, 
it took them a few beats to get back to me. But I, as soon as I turned 18, and it was on my birthday, on my 18th birthday, 3rd of September, and I phoned them up and I said, I am Michelle Neve. I've been under a court order um, up until I was 18 years old. Now, I want to know what's going on with my brother's murder case because, you know, this is not right. The, a child has died and nobody is, is um, suffering the consequences of that and they're still living in the community. A few weeks passed, they phoned me back and said, yeah, Basically, what is going to happen is in 10 years' time, we are going to review the case, like we do with any other case, as a cold murder case, because it's a cold case, it's, that's what they called it. Um, that's what we do. And at 18 years old, mm -hmm. that's that's how I knew. The suspect was, um, uh, was it arrested? Arrested the first time, because it hit the media. And um, we had a meeting before before this person was arrested. They didn't tell us who it was. They didn't say any names or anything. But before he was arrested, the police officer said to me, we are taking this case very seriously. And basically, we're 99% sure that we've got the suspect. We've just got to prove to the CPS that this is the person. Mm. Um, so basically we were told we need to stay away from social media and this and that, it could affect the case. And so I had to like close down my campaign play page. Um, well, I just, I just hid it because obviously I didn't want anybody to um, make their own assumptions on what I'd said. And, and for any any defence to use anything that is said on there against the case. Um, so I didn't want to jeopardise any part of the case at all. But he, he assured me that he had the suspect. Um, and then we writ a uh, personal, no, what was it? Um, personal review, victim review. Did you say victim impact statements? We've written them due to the okay. trial, um, but no, these were um, to write to the CPS because the first meeting was that the CPS are saying that we haven't got enough evidence um, to charge this person. So, um, and basically we had to write how this has impacted us and how this needs to be looked at very closely. Um, because, you know, we're not going to go away. We're going to come back year after year after year, and it's not going to go away. We want to know what sort of evidence you need to charge this person. You know, obviously, we didn't get that sort of information back. Um, the police did. Mm. Um and and they worked on that um, because we actually won the review. So they continued pursuing the suspect because if we hadn't have written that, he would have walked off. He would have walked off. Wow. Um, did Ruth write one? I can't tell you whether she did. Mm. I don't know. I can't imagine what it would have said. My <laughs> Ricky was a lovely boy. He liked football <laughs> and he had big knees. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's pretty much how she talks. So, yeah. Or I miss him every Christmas. I miss him every Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, but gotta have a little bit of this in there as well. Don't don't forget. Yeah, yeah. No, that was James. That was. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't seem to think he was gonna get convicted. No. Um, did you get to see his face when he when he was given a guilty verdict? No. Mm. Um. I wasn't you, there. I couldn't get charged there that day. And I'd been for the last two weeks um, in and out, in and out of the court, like waiting, just waiting. And, and it was far away from you too. It wasn't like in your town. It was. 
So it was in London, yeah. So it's about three hours away from me. So I was leaving at like God, like six o'clock in the morning, um, to make sure I was there for like half ten, ten o'clock, um, and that was pretty much most days. Um, and it cost me an absolute fortune. Not that, not that I mind, you know. Like I'll do anything for my family, but it. It, it did emotionally break me as well, on which I did realise that I, I was drinking a lot um, because I was just, the information that I heard and it just it just brought back all the mem- bad memories and it brought back nice memories of me and my brother as well, but it just, just the pain that I felt when he left and the last time I seen him and what he'd been through and, you know... And, I just it just really hit home it like everything that I tried to put in a box and try and contain it was it got too much for me so yeah it was really an emotional trial for me um many tears many sleepless nights I'd be tossing turning especially when I was waiting for the verdict I couldn't sleep you you even ended up with death threats I think was it during the trial or during the, the 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 reinvestigation when James had been arrested, he skipped bail then, didn't he? Yeah, um, it was it was during my campaign. I had to know who was in connection with this guy, and I did extensive research. And his family were adding me on Facebook, from his nieces to his nephews to his aunties to his. And I thought, how dare you! How dare you come on my page, follow my brother's story when your family member has been suspected of murdering him? And and I did I did send horrible messages saying, get off my page. You know, sure. like and they were saying, would. Well, if you want me off your page, you delete me. No, I'm not the sort of person you can bully and intimidate. You know, you can't intimidate me. You know, if I don't like somebody, I'm not going to go and add them on Facebook. But, yeah, because I opened my mouth and I said, your family member is accused of murdering my child brother. Um, It's rather you, not me, you know, because I can sit there and say, none of my family members have killed anybody and especially not harmed children. So I'd be quite ashamed you know, to even call them my family member or even be friends with them on Facebook because half of them were. They were friends with them on Facebook. And I thought, you know, if that was my sister or if that was my brother or my auntie or my mother or my father that had murdered a little boy or murdered anybody for a fact, I'd be deleting them straight away. Mm -hmm. You, You would not be my friend I would not be associating with you and I certainly wouldn't be claiming that you're my family member. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But because I'd said all that, I got, well, if I don't shut up, then I'll end up like my brother. And I thought, okay, so I'm going to end up like my brother. Okay, we want to take this to a serious level. Okay, I'm going to come and knock on your door and then we'll see how tough you really are. I take these things very seriously. You know. Who said this to you, Rochelle? Uh, The nephew on his Facebook, um, and then he apologised to me because I got really serious with him. I said, that is a serious, a serious thing to say, and you're very stupid to say it. And -hmm. and if someone is telling you to say these things, I'd advise you not to, because, you know, from the world that I come from, if I didn't have children, obviously I have children to think of now, but like when we're younger, we, we have different mindsets but back then when I was younger if you'd have done something to me I'd have come I'd come and harm you you know mm. I'd, I'd come and do the same as you did to them and and that I called a bluff because I wasn't gonna do it you know but I said to them that I'm gonna come and then he he got he got very um scared because the way I was talking to him because I, I I don't take no nonsense from man. Well, your woman. life was threatened. Yeah. You know. And he then admitted to me. He says, I'm so sorry. I says, what are you sorry for? He says, because 
these things, I, I didn't say them. I said, so who did? And he says, my uncle, my uncle said it. And he writ it out. And I says, well, why did you allow him to do it in your name? And he's referring to James him? Watson. James Watson, mm. yeah. And I said, mm -hmm. I said, you know, do you know, you could be in serious trouble. You could get arrested for that. If I went to the police right now, they'd arrest you. They'd have you in the police cell because you just threatened my life and my brother's already dead. So, and you, as a fact, as I already knew before you even opened your mouth, that you were his nephew. And in the end, James Watson and some of his family members phoned the police. So I got a phone call from the police saying, <laughs> you need to stop doing what you're doing. Like, someone's just threatened my life publicly on Facebook and you're telling me to calm down. I'm not calming down. I says, go back to them and tell them that press charges and I'll see them in court. They said to me, well, yes, I understand and you need to send me this proof and blah, blah. So, so I did. And, and they said to me, right, OK, I've gone back to them. And they've said they don't want to press charges. People will play play silly games and they'll 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 try to drag other people down with them. And 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 that's that's a big problem, especially with that family. They'll try and drag anybody else down with them. Um, I've got just two quick questions for you because I know you gotta go and all the batteries yeah. are dying too. But uh there were two yeah. two quick important <laughs> ones. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Um uh, the, the, the second to last question I wanted to ask you is, I, I wonder if we have the whole story. I wonder if there's a potential that James didn't act alone, if there's more to it than we realize. There is that, there is that, that he, he could be taking the brunt of it. Um, which I do, I do believe that he did it. There's, mm -hmm. there's yeah, no way too. about it that he did it. Um, yeah, it does make me wonder because he was seen with other people. But what I think clarifies it for me is that a witness says that they walked off together. Just him and Ricky. Sure. Now that sort of clarifies it for me, um, in a way. But then, in between that, maybe he's told somebody and gone back. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, because I, I do think he acted alone personally. Okay. Um, because I think, because if you drag someone else into that then you're both in it together. Um, and I think as the 13-year-old, that's that's going to be hard to contain, which I, I don't know how he did it, but it's going to be hard to contain that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've discussed my theory with you about, uh, it's and it's just a theory, um, that maybe there was a chance that Ruth put him up to it suggested it seduced uh coerced uh, anything you know um the way yeah. ricky's body was laid out the way the bird was found in james room the drawing found amongst ruth's stuff the fact that neither one of them have to my knowledge spoke about uh the fact that james was in her house um mm. there's just so many empty places there and you might say as i said in the video uh you might say well if that was the case, James would have just busted her on the stand. And I think that that would be wrong because going through James Instagram uh, and, and everything that's out about him, it seemed to me uh, that we're looking at someone very into themselves, as you said, the James Watson show. Um, yeah. And I wonder if James could have potentially looked at it and went, well, you know what? I'm probably going to get seven years or so but I'll get out and I can still maintain that I've, I'm innocent. I will have never admitted to it. He could have mm. maybe thank Ruth or whoever helped, helped him if that's indeed what happened, but he keeps his credibility. I mean, she can't be done again for it anyway. 
mm-hmm. if it was her. So I just wonder sometimes if there's more to it. Maybe we'll never know. But you know what's more important um, is that uh, what you've done with your life and how you've broken the circle. And one of the things I noticed about you, Rochelle, uh, is that you sing. And I wonder why you sing. Because I sing as well. So. <laughs> um, it was an emotional thing for me. It was more to um, let off steam and let people know that because I've I've written a few songs and I've written them all by myself um, about the the not alone and certain things that I've been through in life like um, and how it's changed me Um, yeah it was more an emotional thing to it wasn't anything to become famous, the next pop star or anything. It was just for me. Um, and to let people know that they're not alone and that, and to believe in yourself. You know, you, you can go through, and what I always say is you can go through anything bad in life and don't let it define your future. Um, and that's what I did. As a, as a young person, as an, a young adult, that's all I can say about it, really. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got a beautiful voice and you can totally sense uh, genuineness when, when I watch those YouTube videos. I'm going to put a link to those in the description of this video as well. Um, it's, it's beautiful to see somebody spreading light the way that you're doing it. Um, and another thing I'd like to do is I'd like to make a donation to uh, um, your Ricky and Eve campaign. Uh, use it however you see fit to help with uh, your services. I've seen people on your page reaching out to you that were suicidal and, and you immediately reply and, and you seem to go straight to helping that person. So I want to uh, put something out there to help pay a bill or two. Uh, it's, it's nothing major, uh, but that's from me to you, from the disturbing truth to you, because uh, you are a survivor um, and uh, I admire what you've done, what you and, and what you've made out of yourself, regardless of what you've been through. And it's amazing. I, it's absolute pleasure to have you on the disturbing truth bless you thank you so much and um yeah it's been a pleasure to meet you as well and um be part of what you do and i'm very grateful that you've um showing my brother's case and raising awareness about it like you do with other cases as well which i find is fantastic and that is uh that's really inspirational like to me as well um i'm proud of you so, yeah, yeah. Michelle, it's, it's, that's that's lovely to hear. Um, I, I want to keep in touch as well. I want to know if you've got something new going on. Um, if there's any updates in this case, um, uh, the Ricky Neve campaign or Ricky Neve Foundation, whatever you change the name to, keep me updated yeah. on that too. Um, yeah, maybe I can do. help out in the future again. Th- this is what I want to do. I don't want to just do true crime stories. I want to make an impact. Um, and when I see survivors like yourself that make such a big impact. It just spurs me on to go to go even harder at this. So yeah. you're awesome, Rochelle. All I'll right, speak you to you too. again soon. It's All a pleasure right, to have you. Thank See you later. You. Bye. 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 Bye.